This is the nameless protagonist. Here for a special edition of the dojo in the hidden village here. Today is going to be for the sphere episode number 18 of the Black Manosphere show of the week. And if you guys are interested in having any of your shows or content creators out there want to be featured, just go ahead and message the Roger Report at the blacklist1964 at gmail.com. Again, that is the Roger Report. You can email them at the blacklist1964 at gmail.com. And uh, we'll go ahead and uh, push a one in the chat if you guys can hear me clearly right now. Okay, cool. You guys can hear me all right. Excellent. So I don't know if uh, you guys are familiar with some of the talking points I make in the space. And I've been piecing this set of ideas together for a while. And I definitely want to offer a little bit of preface before I even begin this rabbit hole. <laughs> that I guess I'll be taking you guys along with me for. And just, you know, throw the disclaimer that in general, this is simply my subjective opinion. It is me charting my observations and expressing my observations of what I notice from what's led us to the present moment and where we appear to be headed going on into the future, given the international environment and given our micro environment here in America, and even furthermore, the Edo social complex as a whole and where we kind of fit into this bigger picture. The intention for these observations aren't necessarily to pass some sort of doom and gloom or insult anyone or any group of people that's brought up. It's to provide information and some questions that many people may not have taken the time to consider about themselves their place in the world currently, and where they and their lineage may end up down the line. Questions that deserve to be responded to by the culture in general. And things that other cultures are beginning to shape policy right now as we speak to prepare in response for. Before I get started, let me go ahead and make some acknowledgements in the chat. It's a lot of people here already. Definitely appreciate the turnout. Let's see. Got Lorenzo Jones here first and foremost. Appreciate you being here. Got Skillmonger in the building. I don't know if Roger's here now, but was here a bit ago. Got a young brother, toy of the Texan. What's going on? AM autistic males. What's good, fam? Indigo flow. I see you. Glad you could come through. Got Smitty. <laughs> I saw your videos on Instagram, man. My man's having fun out there. Got me thinking about Amsterdam now. Mr. Z. Yeah, this video is Mr. Z's fault for the record. <laughs> See, we got LaShawn Jefferson. I haven't seen you in a while, family. How you doing? Destro0861. I don't think I've seen you before, but welcome. F Holiday. Good to see you back, fam. We got L Diaspora here. Definitely appreciate you. Divine Dre. Appreciate you, family. Glad you could come through. We got KP. <laughs> Salute, fam. And we got 
Sigma Jones, fellow Black Ronin. Oops. We got Admiral Smoke, aka Gynocratic Garfield, aka Dead Nuke Sand Dog. What's good, family? How you doing? Da Sigma. German reference? Not sure, but either way, salute to you, fam. Mr. Z says I'll probably take the blame. <laughs> yeah, man, this this gonna be it's gonna be a long one, family. Cynical optimist, glad to have you here, fam. Says I know a few, but I'm almost unburied myself, so. I'm way behind on the details of the subject. Yeah, we're going to get into it. But I guess we'll go ahead and get started formally. First and foremost, to the dojo, <clears throat> the founders of the sphere, and you folks in the chat. Us. Definitely appreciate you coming through. Definitely appreciate that. So I've got a lot of freaking notes. <laughs> a lot. And what I think I'm going to do is uh, as I go through these topics, I'm going to sit down and kind of go over these with you guys. Uh, let's see. I want to start with the overview because I think this article does a good job in beginning my exhibit A. The general outline we're going to follow is going over the Dr. John Calhoun mouse utopia experiments. And for those of you who haven't known me for a while, you may have remembered when I sat down and broke down this topic in three different installments with uh, Dr. Nicole Ali. Uh, for those who don't know, she's a genetic engineer who works on cancer. Uh, not too long ago, she ended up having to take some time off for her pregnancy. I think she's doing well from last time I checked and uh, didn't isn't doing too bad given a pretty lucrative project she just got some commissions for so she's been pretty busy but we're definitely going to be reviewing the mouse utopia experiments because i believe they serve as a good pretext to understanding the origins of where i'm creating and getting my hive theory for i believe by and large they serve as a response to the overall conditions that is being brought about that were observed by the mouse utopia experiments. And I think that's an important thing to take into mind and to consideration, especially given the first set of experiments were conducted in 1963. And by the time he got a good control of his model around 1975, a lot's changed. It's been quite some time since his inevitable conclusion to what these things actually mean. And the end result ends up ends up pretty concerning since we see a lot of these things in our everyday lives now that have just been normalized and supplemented by law. And I think as we go through a lot of the end results that his experiments concluded to, you may be able to see immediate parallels to your everyday life. We'll examine the behavior sync from that context and then draw some parallels to what's going on currently in society. After that, we're going to transition to another conversation, breaking down aspects of transhumanism. And I think that's going to set the stage perfectly for introducing and concluding why I bring up hive theory. So to start with, let's get a little couple resources for you guys from the very onset. The conclusion of Dr. John Calhoun's experiments in 1975 amount to his amalgamated research in what he calls death squared. It was placed in an article here. That should serve as a PDF for your records so you can go back and take a look at this information in your free time. You don't necessarily need to take a look at it now, but it's essentially the information that we'll be deriving from. and mostly we'll be examining the final or universe 25 as it was labeled and the notes that were concocted from that death squared article that dr john calhoun wrote 
he went on to publish a lot more material being more so focused on what happens when you take a social species, offer them everything they could need things that can be provided for you by first industrial revolution, first industrialism in general, to where there are no natural predators. You have all your biological and physiological needs met in general. You don't have to worry about adverse effects coming from weather. And even though you're living in close quarters populations, you would want for nothing material. What ensued was a predictable model of events that tracks social behavior over time. And what people have understood and learned is that these phases can be, these behaviors within the population can be amalgamated to phases. And these phases can give indications as to the health of the population. And the general common denominator that really seeds itself with regards to all of this is as these needs continue to get met and as the technology gets more sophisticated and the social roles within the group become more or less undefined so too does the gender so too does the role of any individual within society and as a result there are particular patterns of behavior that are demonstrated that happen after the population explosion that emulate a pretty gruesome set of dysfunctions that lead to an inevitable demise. So much so that even after the conclusion of these experiments, when they try to rehabilitate a lot of these mice into a regular society, they find themselves incapable of reproducing, which is the ultimate inevitability of what transpires at the end of the day. They effectively become sterile and no longer procreate with each other even though they may have the physical ability to do so, no such thing occurs. I'm gonna go ahead and start and we will go with this article because I think this article does a good job in paraphrasing. While we get that going, we'll go ahead and do a couple more acknowledgements. Uh, if you guys have any questions on what I said prior to that, go ahead and let me know now. Uh, before I get started kicking a lot of this stuff off. Let's see, we got Red Line 78. Oops. Aaron Peters here. He says, salute nameless to everyone in the chat. Oops. We got the Roger Report live here. Oops. Appreciate you, family, and thanks again. Ra L, peace. He says, peace, nameless. Trying to get a listen before I go to this Wu Tang and Nas concert. Hey, man, I appreciate you stopping through and uh, definitely enjoy your concert. You can always come by and join the replay gang. <laughs> Let's see. We got Kareem Austin. Os. Shango Zulu. Os. I see you, fam. Lee's Ways, he says, peace, nameless, and chat. I'm listening. I'm listening as well. Oops. D. Wayne, us. Coltrane's Law, peace, brother. I see you, us. It more seven six, part of the Dallas gang. I see you, fam. Us. Got night, light and L. Have you been inactive for a while or have I been missing the streams? I hope you're well, man. Yeah, I've been, it's a little bit of column A and B. Um, I've been a lot more active lately, uh, especially the last month. So I have been gone for a minute, but I do have a lot of content. A lot of people have been saying they haven't been getting notifications. So definitely go back on my channel and take a look at the video section and the playlist section. I make sure to list everything that's there. So, you know, if you don't have a live stream that's up, I've got other pre-recorded content that uh, is there. And I'll definitely be finishing up a couple things and starting some new series as well. We got Jam Far 777, Oops. Dave Dow, Oops. 
He says black pill. <laughs> Geopolitics time. Yeah, man. I hope I don't depress too many people with this one. <laughs> Definitely not the intention. Uh, the good news is I think a lot of this stuff is very correctable. But I think that the way the upper echelons of the world, the ones that are the string pullers, the ones that understand how these things work, I think they've probably settled on this hive model because I think it's probably the most, it's probably the passive path of least resistance that gets them on track and makes sense to the current scenario that we see going on right now. Got Q4, 9-7, os. He says he's been <laughs> developing a tincture in his lab that will make all of us live to be 900 years old. I mean, you know, you're not that far off, man. I've been really working on the uh, the verbal martial arts you guys are familiar with and uh, developing the mind, body, spirit methodology that is largely inspired by a lot of the content I'm going to be reviewing today as part of a means by which we can resist a lot of the inevitable negative repercussions of these things. You know, advancement in society always has its consequences, especially if you don't consider the fact that we aren't just spreadsheet data. We aren't some modality of measurement that can just be quantified by a yes or no switch. You know, we are active human beings with sophistication and various needs. <laughs> so, you know, just some things to really consider. Mice don't give a society. They'll either eat their dead while they're still fresh, but they will go cannibal if there is no food. <laughs> okay, how can that apply to 2022 Black society? We'll definitely get to that point. Because <laughs> we may be a lot there closer than you realize. All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started here with uh, the article. I'll re-paste it in the chat for you guys so you can kind of follow along. Let's see. There we go. All right. The article is What Humans Can Learn from Calhoun's Rodent Utopia Experiment. It begins here. Between 1968 and 1970, American ethnologist John B. Calhoun conducted a behavioral study of captive mice within a nine-foot square enclosure at a rural facility in Polesville, Maryland. Within the enclosure known as Universe 25, several pairs of mice bred a population, which ultimately swelled to 2,220. Eventually, they established social orders that created inside and outside factions, and soon mating ceased altogether. The study confirmed this grim hypothesis based on earlier studies on the Norway rat in small settings. In this theory, he suggested that overpopulation spawns a breakdown in social functions that, in turn, inevitably leads to extinction. Though widely controversial, when first made public, Calhoun's theory raised concern over the years that the social breakdown of Universe 25 could ultimately serve as a metaphor for the trajectory of the human race. Consequently, the, quote, rodent utopia project, end quote, has been a subject of interest among architects, city planning councils, and government agencies around the world. So any of you folks that have degrees in engineering and uh, city planning, you may have already been familiar with some of this information. And if you don't know, this is where a lot of the research for a lot of these manuals was put forward. For the record, a lot of the research that was found here was taken from studying lab mice and brought into the prison system to observe. And all I'm gonna say is the similarities are uncanny. And a lot of the same modalities that they discovered were also subject to within the prison system. And I wanna put a quick pause. Consider the conditions that individuals in the Edo social complex experienced were very similar to the prison systems that we have today, if not worse. Keep that playing in the back of your mind when you think about the role of epigenetics and how certain behavioral characteristics can be passed down from generation to generation to generation. Remember, a culture in motion stays in motion until a greater culture acts upon it. We'll start to the first heading, early rodent studies. Calhoun began his experimental research on rodents in 1947 when he studied an enclosed group of Norway rats in a barn in Roxville, Maryland. 
<clears throat> supplying the critters with unlimited food and water, he expected to see their population swell to 5,000 over the course of a 28-month experiment. However, the population capped out at 200 after subdividing into smaller groups, each of which comprised merely of a dozen, a dozen individuals each. So this enclosure was created to hold over 5,000, and it never exceeded a critical population rate of 200. That alone is pretty interesting. And if you take a look at the metadata throughout society, you see a lot of parallels with that kind of behavior. But I will continue. Continuing with these studies during the 1950s, Calhoun set up a more complex enclosure to examine how further groups of rodents would be <clears throat> would behave in a sterilized, predator-free environment over the course of these experiments. The same sequence of events would transpire each time. So he did this over and over again. And each time, there was a pattern. One, the mice would meet, mate, and breed in large quantities. Phase two, eventually a leveling off would occur. Phase three, after that, the rodents would develop either hostile or cliquish or passive and antisocial behaviors. In the final phase, the population would trail off into extinction. In 1962, Scientific America published Calhoun's observations from his research in the article Population Density and Social Pathology, wherein he continues the he coined the phrase, quote, behavioral sink to describe the results of overcrowding, namely the breakdown of social functions and the collapse of populations in the enclosed rodent environment, hitting the public just as vast urban expansion saw growing numbers of college grads flocking to big cities for work opportunities, many viewed the article as a warning of what would happen to the human race if populations continue to rise at their current rate. And we need to consider at the time when this was going down, everybody was talking about population control and uh, population density. It's kind of where after World War II, people were concerned that there would be things like food shortages and whatnot. And a whole philosophy of thought around this was very pervasive amongst the social scientists and policymakers that was called neo-Malthusianism, I believe, uh, modeled after, I forget it, it's Malthus, I think is his first name, Malthus something. Uh, but he coined the ideology and the concept of population or overpopulation and what the negative effects would be on meeting humanity's needs. And it's during this time period, a lot of organizations came together and scientists came together. And this is where we get a lot of the hybridized foods that we have, which is another conversation for another day. But that was ultimately the solution they came to, which is a big reason why in the, in the 60s, the early 60s, it was a huge boom in crop growth and later on genetic engineering with regards to these crops to alter these foods to grow in more adverse areas so they could provide more food across a broader spectrum of locations. Unfortunately, as we know now, the cost of that was the quality of the food. So just because you have that food doesn't mean it's nourishing you, but I digress. So now let's get into the meat and bones of this. And this is kind of where it gets interesting. Universe 25 Calhoun's experiment with the rodent utopia. Expanding on his earlier studies, Calhoun devised his ultimate research experiment. In Universe 25, a population of mice would grow in a 2.7 square meter enclosure consisting of four pens, 256 living compartments, 16, and 16 burrows that led to food, water, and supplies. With the plague-free environment, and mind you, mind you, this is exactly the way a lot of cities were built. And I'm thinking projects. So just think inner city structuring. This particular setup was made to almost intentionally emulate the way humans have been building currently. With the plague-free environment, a plentitude of comforts, a lack of predation, and an unlimited supply of consumables. The mice would enjoy all the luxuries equivalent to modern human life. Calhoun initiated the experiment with four pairs of healthy mice, which were set loose into the enclosure to begin a new society. During the first 104 days, a phase Calhoun dubbed the, quote, strive period, end quote, the mice adjusted to their new surroundings, marked their territory, and began nesting. This was followed by the exploit period, which saw the population double every 55 days. By the 315th day, Universe 25 contained 620 mice. 
So we're seeing the classic steady explosion, population booming, everything's working. A little bit of a shaky start, but you know things balance out over time. Despite the abundance of space throughout the enclosure, each compartment could house up to 15 individuals, and the overall enclosure was built for a capacity of 30 of 3,000. Most mice were crowding, so however, most mice were crowding selected areas and eating from the same food sources. The act of eating, as it turned out, came to be viewed as a communal activity, which caused most of the mice to favor the same few compartments. So there's kind of a pathology that forms where social interaction and eating become synchronized. So to gain one, the other is psychologically paired with the other. And this is this creates some interesting side effects here. All of this huddling, however, led to a drop in mating, and the birth rate soon fell to a third of its former level. A social imbalance also took place among the mice. One third emerged as socially dominant. Listen to these things. I'm going to say this again. Here's where it gets interesting. One third emerged as socially dominant. A third. The other two thirds turned out less, se less socially adept than their forebearers. As bonding skills diminished among the mice, Universe 25 went into a slow but irreversible decline. And I really want to highlight the keys behind socially adept or inadept, followed by pair bonding. And we're going to go over a lot of literature tied to that a little bit later. Um, but I think this is important because this continues to be a common denominator. And we're seeing a lot of the results of that current day here. In fact, folks in this space get accused of this all the damn time. You know, it, <laughs> it's, it's interesting. But uh, we'll continue with this next part here and then we'll pause to answer some questions and make some acknowledgements of folks coming in. Social status in universe 25. By the day 315, so just about a year, behavior disparities between males of high and low status become more pronounced. I'll say that again. Behavior disparities between males of high and low status become more pronounced. Those at the bottom of the pecking order find themselves spurned from females and withdraw from mating altogether. Having no roles to fulfill within the society of mice, these outcast males wandered apart from the larger groups to eat and sleep alone and sometimes fight amongst one another. Alpha males, by contrast, became more aggressive and pugnacious, often launching into violence with no clear provocation or motive. At times, these males would roam around and indiscrimin indiscriminately, we'll say, sexually assault other mice, regardless of gender. Meanwhile, the beta males, those ranked between the aggressive al uh, alphas and outcast omegas, grew timid, inert, and often wound up being passive recipients of violence. In several instances, bloodbaths ended with the cannibalistic feast of the victors. It gets worse. <laughs> if this isn't already beginning to sound a little bit familiar, I mean, I ain't gonna hype it up, but uh, this is just some pretty simple signs of societal decay in general. And I go back again to the need for social skills, how we evolve to require them, and what the consequences are of substituting that with artificial modalities and the inevitable consequences. But let me go ahead and pause real quick and I'll do a couple of acknowledgements. And if you guys have any questions, don't hesitate to say anything. Uh, let's see, we got Big Duke came through. What's going on, family? Oops. Mike Rizzi says, mass Malthusian delusions. Yeah, I'm not too sold on the whole population, uh, overpopulation nonsense. I think human beings just tend to cluster around each other in some pretty interesting ways. Um, there's just too much damn space on Earth for that to even be an issue. And we probably aren't even going to cap out to where we can. And I'll get into that a little bit later so we can kind of get some numbers down. BGS came through. I see you today, sir. Oh, thanks for coming through and thanks for sharing. Yeah, definitely drop a like if you guys can. I definitely appreciate it. And if it's your first time here and you like what you're hearing uh, or if you've heard me before on other panels, definitely appreciate the, the like and subscribe. Let's see. 
We got Marvel 318 coming through us. Ryle says, sounds like prison, which is an extension of the decay in free society. In fact, the research that was understood here ended up being translated and brought into the prison systems to observe it there as well. So there's definitely a connection. Maybe in another stream, what I'll do is I'll follow up with some of the information that they found when they were studying the prison systems across the world, but in particular in America, especially as it relates to how hierarchies get set up and uh, the way marketers have exploited and taken advantage of a lot of the data that's come from that. I think it's pretty useful information to keep in the back of your mind. But it looks like all of them. No questions from the chat. If not, then we'll go ahead and continue. The infant mortality rate topped 90%. 90%. We'll dig into that. With male mice abandoning their traditional roles in Universe 25, the females were left to fend for their nests by themselves. Consequently, many females adopted more aggressive forms of behavior, which would sometimes spill over into violence towards their young. Others would refrain from motherly duties altogether, banishing their unraised litters and withdrawing from further mating, resulting in serious consequences. In some compartments, the infant mortality rate topped 90%. Calhoun dubbed this stagnation phase, alternative, alternatively known as the equilibrium period. He attributed the overly aggressive and passive behavioral patterns to the breakdown of social roles and rampant overclustering. Now, I want people to kind of digest that. If you've been paying attention to a lot of current events that are coming through, uh, <laughs> you're hearing a lot about infancy mortality, you know, between kids that are infants and then, you know, children that are below the age of 12. You know, this has been popping up in the news a lot lately, interestingly enough. And folks that have been covering other channels bring a lot of these things up, but there's definitely a correlation. When you look at a lot of the reasons as to why this goes down, some common denominators are unsafe environments they experienced while they grew up. Um, I know Rael likes going through a lot of content that really breaks some of these things down and really gets into what trauma and how trauma manifests later on. But again, in these unsafe environments where social roles are either confused or some aspects missing altogether, or there's gross imbalance for any sustained amount of time, you know, it becomes an issue. Let's see. Spain man came in. Oh, I see you. Says, damn, I needed a notification on this. Yeah. Uh, well, we've sent some notifications out. It said it went through. If not, you may want to go ahead and click the bell beside my icon and hit subscribe. And you may be able to go ahead and maybe not miss as much next time. YouTube's been shadow banning folks and toying around with the algorithm. Some people get it. Some people don't. So that's the case. Just unsubscribe and resubscribe or just hit that bell, like I said. Black Dog, oh, I see you. He says, are you teaching Cash App? Uh, I mean, my Cash App is in the description. Uh, if you guys are willing to contribute, I definitely appreciate that. It helps me set aside so I can do some upgrades and get some higher quality content for you guys in the future. CZ says, I heard like 70 to 80% of the human population live within a few miles of the coast. Nameless protagonist, you're right. We're not overpopulated. It's BS. That is very true. The flip side to that, however, is most of those individuals that you just described never really leave a 30-mile radius of their house. And most people, after they go off to college or whatever higher education they're going to, they don't tend to leave that location they end up migrating and staying at, which you know has its own kind of implications down the line as far as demographics is concerned and the effects that's, that that can have on socialization, both good and bad. Let's see, we got Black Uru came through, Kimo Sabe. Ryle says, the lack of masculine development leads to gender confusion as we see in males dressing like females. It ain't no, it ain't, it ain't not make sense to extend this confusion in prison. Yeah, yeah. I mean, 
<laughs> as I described some of this stuff, man, some of y'all, if you're familiar with the prison industrial complex and the crap that goes down there, it's just going to sound copy and paste. Folks really should not be surprised at this. See, we got Leon double eight. Well, glad you can make it, fam. Winston Tokuhisa, I see you. Oops. So, yeah, like as the roles get confused, we're dealing with just a total out of sync loss of womanhood, really, with regards to nourishing the children. When you've got ridiculous mortality rates as a result of a hostile environment where the women pretty much had to form the bulwark of the society there because there just wasn't enough alpha males to stave off the chaos. This is the end result. But it gets worse. A spike in mortality rate. By the 560th day, the population increase had ceased altogether as the mortality rate hovered at 100%. That means just as many people were dying as they were being born. This marked the start of the death phase, a.k.a. the die period in which the rodent utopia slid toward extinction. Amidst the violence, hostility, and lacking and lack of mating, a younger generation of mice reached maturity, having never been exposed to example of normal, healthy relationships with no concept of mating, parenting, or marking territory. This generation of mice spent all their waking hours eating, drinking, and grooming themselves. In reference to their perfected, unruffled appearance, Calhoun called these mice, quote, the beautiful ones. Living in seclusion from other mice, they were spared the violence and conflict that waged in the crowded areas, yet made no social contributions. According to Calhoun, the death phase consisted of two stages, quote, the first death, end quote, and the second death, end quote. The former was characterized by the loss of purpose in life beyond mere existence, no desire to mate, raced young or establish a role within society. This first death was represented by the lackadaisical lives of the beautiful ones, whereas the second death was marked by the literal end of life in the extinction of Universe 25. And I'm going to tell you right now, this part right here, when I first heard about this, struck home hard with what I'm seeing with regards to modern day society. Struck hard lack of purpose and the subsequent consequences that result from that. I think this aspect right here by itself is explaining or can be related to by so many men right now. It's almost hilarious. When you look at what's going on with these beautiful ones, you can identify groups of men like this already in societies. And in particular, there's an overrepresentation of them in first world developed countries. In other words, the more advanced the civilization, the more sophisticated the technology, the more the needs are met with regards to that, the more often this is becoming the reality. And this is just one group in particular that caught these scientists' attention, which is pretty interesting. But I really want to highlight this point of lack of purpose, lack of purpose. It's almost criminal how often it happens here. If you don't have any roles within the society or the peer group that you were born into, because there's this overarching belief that social roles are somehow just intrinsically archaic, old, and abusive. You're denying part of what makes you human. And getting into what we've learned from... Uh, Abraham Maslow and the hierarchy of needs. I find it very interesting how certain cultures seem to approach getting those needs met very differently. But for us in the Edo social complex, we do have an overemphasis on the very things that the mouse utopia experiment made sure to take care of. Immediate safety in a general sense by having outside structures that insulate us, followed by access to food and drink, at least on a baseline level. I just find it interesting that we are utterly barren with our ability to provide purpose and meaning to each other. I mean, it, I, I'll save that for another conversation, but I just wanted to highlight that because that's something that really jumped out to me. 
the sun sets on universe 25. Extending on his observations of the beautiful ones, Calhoun later, uh, later opined that mice, as humans, thrive on a sense of identity and purpose within the world at large. He argued that experiences such as tension, stress, anxiety, and the need to survive make it necessary to engage in society. When all needs are accounted for, no conflict exists, and the act of living is stripped to its barest, barest physiological essentials of food and sleep. In Calhoun's view, herein is the paradox of life, work, or conflict. When all sense of necessity is stripped from life of an individual, life ceases to have purpose, and the individual dies in spirit. Gradually, the mice that refused to mate or engage in society came to outnumber those that formed gangs, sexually assaulted and plundered, and fed off their own. The last known conception of Universe 25 died on day 920. And I want that to be understood. They went from day 500 and something to day 920 of experience in this decay, meaning abnormal became normal for longer than they'd ever been normal in the first place. I really want that to be highlighted. You've got an expansion and a takeoff, a leveling off, and then a slow antagonizing decline that generation after generation, the definition of normal just goes out the window. On day 920, at which point the population was capped at, 20, at 2,200, well short of the enclosure's 3,000 capacity. Even though there's an endless supply of food, water, and other resources there for the mice, it didn't matter. The behavior sink had set in, and there was no stopping Universe 25 from careening itself into its self-made demise. Soon enough, there was not a single living mouse left within the enclosure. Not a single one. I'm going to take a second and uh, acknowledge some arrivals here. Got red line 78. Ah, uh, yes. The smooth mouse experiment. Yeah. Yeah, it's this again. <laughs> Jan Farr says economics is, force, is forcing increased urbanization, unfortunately. It's having an opposite but inverse effect. Um, I think something a little bit different is going on that is having an interesting effect that is emulating this in a strange way. I don't think we're experiencing so much the effects of having close physical proximity as we are a kind of paradoxical overcrowding in a social sense with regards to how we identify with being in social media but at the same time, an isolation effect where we're simultaneously not interacting with each other physically, but almost exclusively reducing it to an online capacity, especially with the way we learn to socialize with each other, where you find examples of people who are sitting right next to each other, texting one another instead of opening their mouth and speaking. And I mean that with family members that even bother doing things like eating dinner together, if, if that's even a thing for most people. And we saw that disappear pretty much overnight during the 90s. Adrian Thomas asked, nameless, you take PayPal. Yes. Uh, let's see. I don't have my phone set up here. But check my email on my uh, profile. My PayPal info should be there. And we'll take a pause in a little bit, and I'll go add that Uh to the title description so you guys can go ahead and utilize that if you see fit. Let's see, Leon88 said, I learned all about this in psychology and lifespan. I watched a few videos in my free time. Yeah, a lot of people just have not been made aware of this. And because this came out so long ago, man, a lot of other intellectual properties and research has been based off of this that you wouldn't even know this is what they were talking about or this is what was being made reference to. They may, you know, drop reference to it in a footnote, but this is pretty much the ground zero where all of this conversation originates and comes from. So I like looking at the actual words that, you know, the actual raw data that was being stated. 
uh, again, for those new, if you want the conclusion of or the article that was done by Dr. John Calhoun that breaks all of this down, I'll link this again in the chat. It is death squared. There's a PDF to that. Definitely save that for your notes and review it in your free time after the stream, whenever you like. Uh, I think the content from that feeds itself. Let's see. We will soon cover it from the from the feminine perspective. Oh, he says something prior to that. I read white women say that in, that traditional African societies is the proper way for women to live. The rites of passage were sure were to ensure mental were ensure mental and the proper masculine and feminine development. Yes, were to ensure. Yeah. Initiation is the means in which masculine and feminine development is achieved. Me and Complex Design covered this from the masculine development on the brain trust, and we will soon cover it from the feminine perspective. I wholeheartedly agree. agree. I think it provides a context for you to relate to the rest of the world. Having a particular worldview under which you can relate to others by has been taken for granted so much because of a lot of the newer politics that have been moved and presented to the forefront to try to destroy gender roles or treat them as oppressive. And we'll get into a little bit of that because when we hear comments in the modern era right now about how men are supposed to be the leaders and take initiative over all of these other things, I don't think they realize the way people are being socialized, not just at home, but more specifically in school and how any developmental psychology that would help to create boys that would do this later on into manhood, it's being stifled before they even get an opportunity to do that, let alone there's absolutely no examples of what this modality looks like outside of seeing women in charge and essentially being the overlords of their well-being left and right. I mean, it's unfortunate that women can't adopt to this because they still need a masculine directive energy presence in order to stay feminine, but no one's being honest about the conversation and the cultural fallout that results from this. They're just going full steam ahead. They let the, the college and the universities continue to back a lot of these things. And the psychological institutions are now really touting this doctrine as though it's normal, which is it should concern people more than what it actually is right now. And it's very frustrating. See, we got Art New Style. Well, I see you, fam. Glad you can make it through. Yeah, today's going to be a long one. I'm going to be running my mouth for a minute. So, you know, <laughs> you could definitely catch the replay if it um, ends up being a bit winded. Let's see. Black Ooh Strike says, it's a simple question. Would you give, what would you give, what would you give your life for? If there was nothing you would die for, you probably don't have much of anything that's worth living for. And <laughs> that state of being is so common amongst people on a baseline. You can understand why people preoccupy themselves with getting their or overexpressing those bottom two portions of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I think a lot of the current behavior is very indicative of that. A lot of people living in their shadows and playing out their shadows at this point. This is he says, I'm always confused about the ending. Are we saying that we can never be comfortable because once we are too comfortable, we start engaging in destructive behavior? You know, I think the ending is clear, man. We need purpose. We just need purpose. Have all of these advancements in technology, but aspire to a higher purpose. In fact, Maslow's hierarchy of needs was all about talking about self-actualization. You know, it's my subjective opinion, and this is this is a good series, a good field of study in psychology that is misused by the level up community, which is positive psychology. I think it provides a lot of temporary sources, but if they aren't grounded by anything solid through self-exploration, through mind, body, and spirit, I don't think you get to that point self-actualization that can help you in a healthy way stave off the inevitable the inevitable conclusion of what we see within these death spirals and at least provide some sort of context whenever a population is at that equilibrium phase where it's starting to stall out. And even though the population's growing, the rate of expansion is slowing down. 
because it just seems like every time, once it slows down past a certain point, it doesn't speed up again. Got LaShawn. It's okay. I'll caveman club any trying anybody trying to bother me. If if only way going to leave me alone is to club them and the head doesn't work, we got clubs too, and they really hurt. Well, we'll see how that goes with uh how some of these other scenarios came down. We'll go ahead and continue shortly. Black Dog says, <laughs> Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade for a reason. <laughs> Message. <laughs> Let's see, Arya, thanks for joining. Let's see, I think the difference between the mice and the human is we are developing technology that pushes us to ask, what is human anyway? You're jumping ahead, Z. You're jumping ahead. You are jumping ahead. <laughs> See, I think I got most folks. The number one grinder. What's going on, underrated? Glad you can make it. Us. Salute to you, Detroit 313. Got BMT. Stopping by to check on my homie. It's been a while since we talked. Indeed, fam. Uh, just glad to have you, man. Hope you're doing all right. You can always slide through, family. Us. We got black men being brutally honest. Long live the habitual line steppers. I see you. And call T. Thanks for showing up, fam. I appreciate you. Let's see, I think I am caught up in the chat. Charles Gilmore. Us. Respect, fam. Okay, we're almost done with the article here, so we'll go ahead and get through the next little bit of this. All right. Failed salvage attempt and concluding observations. Before the rodent utopia imploded entirely, Calhoun removed some of the beautiful ones to see whether they would live more productive lives if released into society, free of social strife and carnage. Placing these mice in a fresh setting with a few pre-existing residents a scenario similar to that which greeted the initial pairs placed in Universe 25, he expected the beautiful ones to wake from their social, from their asocial haze, that's a cool word, asocial, asocial haze, and answer nature's call to populate the barren environment. However, the mice relocated, the relocated mice showed no signs of change from their earlier behavioral patterns, refusing to mate or even interact with their new peers. The reclusive mice eventually died of natural causes, and the fledgling society folded without a single new birth. In Calhoun's view, the rise and fall of Universe 25 proved five basic points about the mice and humans as well. Number one, the mouse is a simple creature, but it must develop the skills for courtship, child rearing, territorial defense, and personal role fulfillment on the domestic and communal front. If such skills fail to develop, the individual would rather reproduce, the individual will neither reproduce nor find a productive role within society. Key right here, find a productive role within society. As with mice, all species will grow older and eventually and gradually die out. There is nothing to suggest human society isn't prone to the same developments that led to the demise of Universe 25. If the number of qualified individuals exceeds the number of openings in society, chaos and alienation will be the inevitable outcomes. Individuals raised under the latter conditions will lack any relation to the real world. Physiological fulfillment will just be their only drive. We've seen what that looks like. Just as mice thrive on a set of complex behaviors, the concern for others developed in post-industrial human skills and understandings is vital to man's continuance as a species. The loss of these attributes within a civilization could lead to its collapse. I mean, you know, this is this is fear porn if I've ever read some, but I mean, we've seen little bits and microcosms of this in our everyday lives pretty regularly. Sociologists have been tracing a lot of this for a while now, and flags have been raised, but 
a lot of this has just been kept very quietly under the table. You know, folks know it or they just try to auto dismiss it. But when you look at the data throughout society, throughout the world, really, the common denominator is first industrial worlds. And there's a particular set of thought and theory that follows a lot of these first world industrial modalities of thought and politics. And it begins with an F. Shout out to Toya the Texan for highlighting that, but I digress. We'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. C says, nameless. Wait a minute. I'm not wrenched up. Excuse me, sir. I'm offended. There's a lot of folks not wrenched up, fam. We'll deal with the wrench game when we have a little bit of an intermission. So stand by. <laughs> Let's see. Plus, isn't this the first time you've been here, Z? Maybe not, but we'll see. He said, WAP, women being next app. <laughs> but Sean ain't shit for that. <laughs> okay, we will go ahead and see how much we got left. Yeah, we don't got too much of this. And we can get started with the digestion of this scenario. In 1972, Calhoun shared his observations about the results of the rodent utopia in an essay entitled Death Squared. I'll put a link to that in the chat for the PDF for that, by the way. Uh, the explosive growth and demise of a mouse population, end quote. This work gained instant notoriety for its grim outlook on the consequences of an overpopulated, overstatiated society. Given all the strife that had been impacting the world in the years immediately before, Vietnam, race riots, political assassinations, the Cold War, China's Cultural Revolution. The public was fearful Calhoun's findings were indicative of mankind's then present course. The examples of rodent pillage and carnage in the wake of overcrowding seemed to mirror the social unrest of the 60s and 70s within human society, which conceded with unprecedented urban sprawl. Despite the grim parables presented in Calhoun's observations, he wasn't trying to imply humankind was headed down a similar path towards extinction. While he definitely saw parallels between the downfall of Universe 25 and some of society's ills, he stressed humans as a more sophisticated species had the wisdom and ingenuity to reverse trends. And I agree with that. After all, humans have science, technology, and medicine, all of which gave mankind the ability to pinpoint causation, advert disasters, heal wounds and illnesses, and explore new environments. He also pointed out that Universe 25 was not a natural habitat, as it was supplied with an abundance of food and luxuries and kept free of predators and disease. Hope for mankind? Still, Calhoun feared mankind would lurch toward a similar doom if cities became overcrowded and the population swelled beyond the capacity of the job market. To help society find ways to prevent this, form, this from ever happening, he spent part of his latter career exploring different forms of human advancement, which he extended to the concept of space colonization. Keep that in mind. To that end, he formed an academic team called Space Cadets. Its purpose was to promote the idea of humans setting up colonies on other planets. Calhoun also focused on city planning, which he felt was key to avoiding behavioral sync that was known in Universe 25. He believed the design of cities was partially responsible for the ways in which inhabitants interacted with each other and steps should be taken in tandem with development to maintain positive communication among people. As part of this effort to promote an alternative concept of city design, he tinkered with the utopia model with more than 100 further universes over the next two decades, meaning he was doing this well into the 80s. His work in this area was highly esteemed among city planning councils of the United States and abroad. And the article concludes here, and we'll go ahead and get to the conclusion so we can uh, address the chat again. The human population could top 9.6 billion by 2025. Just for a quick upright, right now, we're just, we're, we're at about, we're, we're looking at 8 billion. So we're kind of getting there. And we'll see when we look at the numbers as to what this is looking like. More than four decades has passed since Calhoun conducted his Universe 25 experiment. Nonetheless, questions linger whether the observations he drew from the rodent utopias collapse. Most pressing is the question of human population, which globally could top 9.6 billion by 2050 if we stay on the current course. The population trend arouses numerous concerns. One, 
Will mankind continue to thrive if the population exceeds the number of available jobs? What about disruptive technology, whereby a new product of innovation renders whole fields obsolete or a task that once required multiple hands can now be completed with the press of a button? Check one. If most jobs are outnumbered by technology, what will, what will sustain the economy? Will large cross sectors of the population become destitute or will the billionaire class support everybody? Andrew Yang, anybody? UBI, anybody? How will people function and interact with one another in the world where no one hardly works? Can an individual develop interpersonal skill when there's no need to pursue working relationships in the outside world? At the very least, mice and men seem rather similar when Calhoun's research is compared to the modern day civilization. Thus concludes the article. So for a lot of folks that have been paying attention, uh, a lot of red flags probably came up listening to that that has been very familiar with various bodies of work that kind of talk about end times and all of that. Let me go back and revisit the chat up here. Da, da, da. See what you guys are saying now. Diaspora L asks, how does this study converge with the beehive structure in the hyena clan? We are definitely getting there. And it's really in the spirit of trying to avoid this outcome we just finished describing. And I want to tie in and highlight how these characteristics are lining up with the big wild card being the introduction of the fourth industrial complex. And we're going to work our way to that point in just a couple minutes. Let's see. This is, he says, I have purpose. I do everything in life to have nice-ish. <laughs> I'm kidding, but I think that's the phase we're in. Yeah. Yeah. Black Guru says, religion, family, community, industry were all things we would believe in and aspire to. Any which any of these things, which any of those things should a modern man give his life to and expect to get any fair return. And that the paradox right there. <laughs> That is the, the existential paradox with regards to the question of meaning. And I deal with that a lot in some of the content that I have already on my channel when I'm really examining some of the philosophical ideas of the abyss, you know, and not only how to cope with that, but how to come to a conclusion with regards to that. I think it's why, you know, in the near future and lately, you guys have really been hearing me harpoon concepts such as trust amongst us in the space and learning how to learning how to communicate with each other in a way that isn't intrinsically hostile and trying to cultivate goodwill, at least in a way that's sustainable for you so that you can establish healthy barriers so folks aren't violating you while doing so. You know what I'm saying? Because there's there's a lot missing here. And there's a lot that we can address to help make this way less stressful, but I don't think people see the bigger picture and how much this has had a toll on society as a whole, but us in particular. So the beautiful ones enjoyed life. I mean, you know, big town, man, go your own way. I don't, I don't blame the beautiful ones. Although I think the herbivore men of Japan is probably a better illustration of that. I got a whole video I did on them too, technically. Let's see. Black Guru says, there were roles we adopted merely via that we were born, <laughs> what our sex was, race, and geography. The reason to live, we're prepared. I agree. How do you do that in a world where a woman isn't even a woman anymore? And Black Uru has jumped ahead to exactly where we're about to be heading pretty soon. Because a lot of the problems that are presented in the current environment right now, I believe, and it is of my subjective opinion, that there was an unattended consequence when you tampered with people's roles that you also didn't provide or offer a meaning 
to counterbalance that. And so people have been left to overexpress and overindulge in just baseline physiological needs and substitute that for meaning and purpose and existence in, with reality. Winston asked, did anyone mention the rats of Nim? You know, the rats of Nim were actually based on this exact work, just for the record. It, it was literally a copy and paste of it all. See, I'm sure within the next hundred years, we'll see human settlement on the moon and Mars, and I concur. At least I think that's where a lot of money and resources is being directed towards for a lot of different reasons. A lot of different reasons. One of which is to avoid this scenario in a lot of in a lot of cases, but they're running into they've got some challenges to overcome. They're working on it. Folks that are really big on tech already see a lot of the emerging technologies that are being prepared right now to try to address some of those challenges. So I think what you're going to see first is the creation of smart cities. They'll start here on major populated areas, and then you'll find smart cities that are in very remote locations that find themselves to be very, very auto efficient. But maybe that can be another conversation for getting in the fourth, boy, uh, fourth, fourth industrial revolution urban organization and whatnot. He said, when transgender men that converted to your side and you got black women co-sided him, when transgender men that converted to your side and you got black women co-sided, or I guess he's saying co-signing him, not being a black man, that can do what? I'm gonna make some microwave. And we'll get to that, the alphabetization. Faber, welcome to the chat. He says, I think the human version of this is already being attempted with the Venus Project. Indeed. People have become gradually socialized and become biologically despondent to their environment and interpersonal relationships, among other things. Yeah, you guys are already starting to pick up what I'm putting down. And I guess we should go ahead and jump into that now. Great stuff. Oliver the Gray, appreciate you. Oops. All right. So that was the introduction. <laughs> there's a couple things I wanted to make sure we revisit uh, some details that the article left out. So when we get into the phase where things are beginning to break down and we enter into the equilibrium phase, it's during this phase where everything's doing well and there's this idea that there's a massive overabundance that we get this pattern that shows up in all of these different mouse experiments that were conducted. The first one is the two classes of females. You get one class of females that essentially are left to do all of the, pre the procreating and reproduction. Then we have the percentage of females that weren't in the socially accepted class or caste and they ended up isolating into their own social groups, doing their own thing. And they generally didn't intermingle with the population either. And the common denominator between the females within that modality is that there was a gradual loss of the maternal instinct. And with the onset of the males and their split, less and less alphas were there to help maintain a sort of pseudo balance. They were stuck guarding their territory constantly. And eventually, you know, John Henryism failed and they ended up being overcome by these chaotic conditions. The chaotic conditions that were trailing and plaguing these mice were the three major designations, four technically, but I'll get into the main three. First, among the males, you had a group of them that essentially began demonstrating behavior that at first was labeled homosexual, but soon was relabeled as pansexual. What you saw were male 
Y chromosome having mice socializing and being around the female mice behaving just like they are and demonstrating behavior of wanting to mate with the alpha males that were there. And what's curious about this is that the male mice that were the alphas didn't turn away those advances. You had an entire third of these mice pansexual. They didn't try at all to mate with the female mice. Then we've got the second classification. And they make up a sizable majority of being another 33%, uh, depending on the makeup. But uh, they were a sizable portion. I think this is pronounced sonobolists, sonobolists. I call them zombies. Effectively, all they did was wander around the enclosure and everybody literally ignored them. They didn't try to do anything. They just ate, they slept, they walked around, they didn't bother nobody, they didn't fight nobody, they weren't violent. They were just drifters, wanderers, doing absolutely nothing, simply existing. These males were doing this in droves. And keep in mind, this is that intermediate C phase that we're talking about. The phase of equilibrium where everything's balanced out. And then you have the last category, or third category rather, I should say, that really got everybody's attention for the most part and left them very concerned, the probers. Characteristics that, yes, Winston, that word right there, that's the word I was trying to say. Thank you, appreciate you. These probers are attributed to having behaviors associated with hyper-aggressiveness, hypersexuality. They are utterly and completely antisocial. And they, with relentless abandon, pursued females. This was pretty much what ended up exhausting all of the alpha males. The amount of male mice that were in this cast classification literally made those places a living hell. Every time those mice came in the heat, the female ones, those other prober mice would never let them relent. Generally speaking, they had different kinds of raiding rituals, rituals that would, you know, be carried out that were all about courtship. That went out the window. They were just rolling up on them overtly and just repeatedly after repeatedly chasing them into the burrow. It was terrible. And it got so bad that the stress levels were leaving a lot of the females to where they would go from having five pups, five to 10, maybe 12 pups at a time to only one. And in a lot of instances, these pups were being reabsorbed into the womb. Miscarriages, in other words, were happening left and right. There was no time for these female mice to actually raise these kids. And it left them in a position to where there was just no more maternity instinct that was left because they had to focus exclusively on survival. Now, keep in mind, this is in contrast to the beautiful ones that we see in Universe 25, where you've got a segment of the males that just pretty much checked out of society and, <laughs> and uh, did their own thing in, in a completely separate section of the enclosure. And keep in mind, this entire setting, these universes are designed to actually hold 5,000 mice, and they never went above... 200. Never went above 200. So there's plenty of space. There's plenty of space for these things to go. They're not necessarily trapped. But every single time you see these same breakdowns the way we were describing. And I find that concerning, but it's consistent. From there, all you got to do is take a look at, you know, the article I linked. Uh, his notes are in the PDF, and you can see how a lot of these things conclude inevitably. Ultimately, the population effectively becomes sterile. The social rules aren't passed down and nobody sees any purpose to do anything. Let me see if this is going to cause an 
issue now. Copy and go. Let's see. World Health Organization. Okay. So we are going to get into the very first reference I want to present or present to you guys. Let's see the relevant sector of society. Da, 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 da. Accepting steps, steps to da, 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 da. basically here is one reference that is tracing the state of social isolation amongst modern populations today. And we're also going to go over another one here that's a better publication from the CDC that really spells this out very clearly. We'll go ahead and do these top three paragraphs right here real quick. Uh, actually, no, I'm gonna do this last paragraph here. Evidence suggests that a significant portion of the population was already socially isolated, lonely, or both prior to the pandemic. So this came out 2021. So you guys have a sense of orientation towards it. Uh, this came out 2021. This is from the uh, National Library of Medicine. I like drawing from them because again, they've got a lot of good primary source, source content. A lot of the funding for a lot of these things get uh, get printed here whenever these experiments conclude or whenever these studies conclude. But uh, yeah, there's a, there was a lot of presupposition on the idea that this was going on because of COVID, but this has been long happening long before COVID arrived. It says evidence suggests that a significant portion of the population was already socially isolated, lonely, or both prior to the pandemic. Social isolation refers to objectively being alone, having few relationships or infrequent social contract contacts, whereas loneliness refers to the subjective feeling of being alone or the discrepancy between one's desired level of connection and one's actual level. While international standardization of measurement and classification is needed to provide more precise estimates for prevalence and changes over time, substantial evidence from both national and international surveys raise concern. Several surveys suggest that loneliness has increased by 20 to 30% during the pandemic. And loneliness can occur across all age, income levels, and living situations or gender. However, rates are highest among those at younger ages with lower incomes and with chronic health conditions. The risk factors are similar to those identified pre-COVID or pre-319. So uh, again, we're back again to the biggest demographic hit being folks who don't have their lives set up together and, and straight already. And we see that this hits disproportionately with men who if you look at the actual suicide rates, there's a direct correlation between the two. Let's see, we got a second resource here we wanna present. This one is from the CDC. And I wanna drive home the adverse effects that this has and does have. Rather, what it's what it's had, you know, in precedence, and what it's doing now. Loneliness and social isolation linked to serious health conditions. And we'll just do a quick skim over some of this stuff. Just in the first paragraph, loneliness and social isolation in older adults are at serious public health risk, affecting a significant number of people in the United States and putting that risk for dementia and other serious critical medical conditions. Scroll down a little further. Although it's hard to measure social isolation and loneliness, there's strong evidence that many adults aged 50 and older are socially isolated or lonely in ways that put their health at risk. Recent studies found that social isolation significantly increased a person's risk of premature death, <coughs> pre 
premature death in all causes and risks that may rival those of smoking, obesity, and physical inactivity. Let me say that again. They're putting it on par with being more dangerous than smoking, obesity, and physical activity. Social isolation was about 50% increased risk of dementia. Poor social relationships, as we mentioned before, characterized by social isolation or loneliness, was associated with a 29% increase of heart disease and 32% increased risk of stroke. Loneliness was associated with higher rates of depression, anxiety, and suicide. Loneliness among heart failure, among heart failure patients was associated in nearly four times risk increase of death, 68 increased risk of hospitalization, and 57% increased risk of emergency department visits. There's even a section here for the alphabet modality. Immigrant LGBT, LGBT people are at higher risk. <clears throat> the report highlights loneliness among vulnerable older adults includes alphabet, LBGTQ populations, and minorities are victims of elder abuse. It also points out that the literature base for these populations is sparse and more research is needed to determine risk impacts and appropriate, and appropriate actions needed. So you can believe that there's gonna be a lot of research that's gonna come up out of that pretty soon. And uh, further down, there's more researches that you can sort of dig into that offer suggestions and how to try to tackle that modality. But uh, definitely worth looking into and seriously considering. I mean, it isn't just here, it's happening in a global sense. With regards to that, it is a direct consequence of people being surrounded by a bunch of others, but utterly and completely non-contacted or, or ill or asocial with regards to people that can create healthy relationships. You learn all of this through socialization. Let me go through this last piece right here before we revisit the chat. Next point I want to draw people's attention to is the global fertility rate within the first world, global fertility rate. And let's see here. Get this reference, copy, paste. And go. All right. Now, remember what we talked about with that state of equilibrium earlier in the Mouse Utopia experiment. I'm going to give you this first link. This data. This data comes from the UN. The article is called Five Key Findings from the 2020 UN Population Prospects. And this is a summation of the data for 2022. And we'll just read some of the headlines because the big thing is in the chart right here. Since 1975, the world has been adding another billion people every 12 years. It passed its milestone of 7 billion in 2011. And by 2022, it will pass another one. There will be 8 billion people in the world. While this rate of absolute growth is similar to previous decades, the growth rate, and that's the key right here, the growth rate continues to fall. Since 2019, the global population growth rate has fallen below 1%. As global fertility rates continue to fall, this rate will also continue to fall. And I want people to peep the global rate, which tracks what was going on from 1950 to 2021. Look at this chart, family. Look at this chart. It's... We had a lot of pieces of legislation passed. We had a lot of booms in technology go down. And it's had 
quite a bit, quite a bit of notice worldwide. And when you start breaking this information down by demographic, you start seeing some very obvious patterns. I think the only place on earth right now that isn't as adversely affected currently for now is the continent of Africa in aggregate. But I bet if you start doing some comparisons, you're going to see some similarities to the rest of the world, depending on where in Africa you start tracing, which could be a video for another day. But I really want people to look at that damn chart. And you can't blame it all on COVID-19, but it definitely didn't help. However, we've got another chart to help support what we are looking at. This one is taken from let's see macro trends. Yep. And this kind of spells it out with napkins and crayons for folks. This is from macrotrends.com. It pretty much traces everything under the sun. It extrapolates a gang of information from all over the damn place. And they just took the same data from uh, the UN and put this in chart form. And you can just see the information here. Again, it's a good source and resource to save if you want to take a look at some other data. But, you know, it's making a projection. And the future looks pretty stagnant. <laughs> Let's see, the data points right here state, the chart and the world fertility rate from 2050 to 2022, United Nations projections are also included throughout the year 2020, I'm sorry, 2100. The current fertility rate for the world in 2022 is 2.4.28 births per woman at a 41, at a 0.41% decline from 2021. And each year it's been a similar amount of decline each year going all the way down from the way they trace it. The rate is coming to a slow, gradual crawl. Key thing being rate. And I think below you can kind of get, uh, you can get a bigger model of the data points and see what they were actually charting. And they've got other parameters and demographics that you can you can follow. They've got the infant mortality rate you can look at, which you know corresponds to what we were talking about earlier. But uh, you know, these are things I really want people to sort of consider and keep in the back of their mind when they look at the bigger picture. Especially when we think about how policy is being made right now to try to circumvent and curb these things because there was clearly a direct correspondence to the changes in policy, the introduction of feminism, and we're going to call it, quote, progress. I don't want to blame this on progressives. We're going to call it modern thinking with regards to gender roles and its effect that it's having on the population as a result. And what we see being expressed because the technology can eat and absorb so much of this. But before I go to my third point, I want to go ahead and acknowledge the chat again for a second, see what we got going on. Uh, again, any questions you guys have, anything you want clarified, anything that you may have missed, uh, definitely type it out, say something. Uh, like and subscribe and share the video if you can. And we'll jump right back into it pretty shortly. Z says, this ish was nothing but red flags. But no one outside of this segment of the space speaks about it. A technological utopia and a social dystopia. I mean, they got a whole genre set up on that, man. Shout out to freaking uh, Cyberpunk. Let's see. Jamfar777 says, look up the harlot riding the beast. God isn't there for me. Can't comment for anyone else. I mean, Revelations made some interesting perceptions and projections. I begin to wonder if it's more of a self-fulfilling prophecy than something that was actually destined to be. But uh, I'll leave the chat to decide that. Let's see. The show Expanse shows a colony on Mars of people living on the moon. It's a great underrated show. Ta-da. 
So we're going to post modern. Yeah, shout out to Jordan Peterson, indeed. Let's see. Da -da -da -da. <laughs> Said I'm grading my student's name, which is also oh, ha. synchronicity, man. It's a thing. Let's see. Oh, we got folks in the chat jumping ahead. Y'all jumping ahead. We'll definitely get there in a little bit. <laughs> You know what? Right here, this comment right here. Black men surrounded by thousands of black women begging for a man, but they respect their black queen's pick. <laughs> That's a lot of females that don't have a man for a while, part of the hive. <laughs> LaShawn, you're, you're learning. You're piecing it together. Keep, keep going in that direction. <laughs> Winston says that term, and I think he was referring to this right here. He says it means sleepwalker. Okay, I called him zombie, so I wasn't far off. Good to know. Trial Bentley said Pookie Mice. I can't. <laughs> and you got these, these probers on some simp stuff, man. Probably. Although it would explain a lot of folks that are doing the whole mass shooting, you know, that kind of hyper antisocial behavior that's expressed by a very specific demographic. You don't see a lot of folks that are highly melanated doing goofiness like that on a regular basis. But that's another convo. People think that this is not at all connected, but it all is. Money, loneliness, class, violence, sexuality, childbearing, etc. It It is, and it's criminal to the point where it's criminal in that it's excluded from the conversation. Because I think people are missing out on a lot of opportunities to problem solve. Because if you're looking at a potential problem, it may be a it may be a symptom of something deeper, and in trying to offer a contextualist solution towards it all, you may actually create more problems down the line than what you actually solve. And it's unfair because the next generation is going to be the one stuck trying to clean this mess up. And we're left with where we are now. You know, I think a lot of the modern day conversation is a lot of good intended bad decisions that are just compounding on one another right now because society is a system. It's not some sort of isolated algorithm that you can just tamper one thing here and there when a syntax error pops up and you're done. Everything has consequences. Let's see, Rael gives a reference to a book says, this book spells out scientifically the importance of human connection. Disease usually comes from traumatic experience. Never dealt. I agree. At least that's definitely a point of origin. Let's see. Yep, I agree. And I think it's playing postmodernism. Yep. And I think people at the ground level that are acutely experiencing this, uh, it's kind of like the frog in the boiler, right? You know, I don't think people are really considering the point of origin or the impetus of a lot of these changes and how the culture needs to be responsible and coming up with a solution for a lot of these things. And recklessly abandoning institutions like family the way they are it's not helping anybody in solving a lot of these issues. And it's careening people into a particular direction that I don't think they're prepared for or want to be in because their sense of agency is gonna be a lot less than what they're comfortable with. Even if folks are able to get by currently, the precedent set for the next generation is difficult. Well, Josh, funny you say that. Also, welcome to the chat. Oops. Uh <laughs> Put a pin on that. We'll get to that point in just a little bit. Let's see. Jordan said, did he find educated lame mice? I can't. <laughs> they don't want them, man. They became beautiful ones at this point. Let's see.
Well, what I will say is the absence of love and fear tends to be indifference. I'll just leave that for folks. Go professor came through. He said, what's happening, family? What's going on with you, Gold P? Oh, We've got the constructive consultant. Oh, glad you can make it. He says we cover some of the most cutting edge research in human interaction, micro and macro. And I really wish people would appreciate the difference between the two and stop conflating it. Because you can't solve all macro problems only looking and understanding the nature of the micro. Individual success and probability or possibility does not influence the macro probability. You need probability to get things done to solve a system if you want outcomes for the collective. I think that is a very important point people miss and create disingenuous conversations over, unfortunately. Charles Gilmore says something here. Most people float through life not knowing why they are alive. The answer, quote, I'm just trying to live. I wholeheartedly agree. And I think the arts play a profound role in helping people cope with a lot of the things that are being discussed today. But all you got to do is kind of take a look at what's happening to art in all of its forms and expressions and see how it's being de-emphasized because people aren't flipping profits off of it the way they can. And even if they are, it's become commercialized to a point where expression, because they need to make sales with regards to it, is killing the purpose behind it. It's very frustrating. Let's see. D. Stu, welcome, fam. Oops. He says, first time here. Peeps you from my brother, Truth, as I know it. Salute to the chat. Oops. Yeah, glad you glad you came through. Yeah, BGS mentions the lying flat. They're doing that all over Asia, family. Folks, folks are swiping out. <laughs> Juice ain't worth the squeeze in the society, Ben. It's definitely some consequences tied to that. But it looks like we've caught up. And we will get into the parts that are bound to offend people. So let me go ahead and get my antagonist cap out. Get that red lightsaber going. We will get it cracking. All right, let's see what portion did I want to show you guys with this one? Ah, it was this goofy article. Here we go. The next modality of conversation as it pertains to roles. Point three, removal of gender roles and early socialization of children to the roles. I don't know what it is with this modern era, but Thanks to a lot of the conversation with specifically third wave feminism, they have effectively waged war against the nuclear family model under the context of trying to impose gender equality. And they believe that gender roles serve as some sort of archaic tool of oppression that creates a society that isn't tolerant. And they cite very loose justifications for it. Most of which are pretty cynical uh, with regards to their perspective of the outcomes of these institutions. And I don't think people know what these kids are actually being taught in school these days. You've got, for example, here, and we'll go to the conclusion section so we can get a little bit of an understanding of their view on all on all of this. Conclusions, in quote. And this is from the Encyclopedia on, Encyclopedia on Early Childhood Development. It reads, quote, schools are important context for the socialization of young children's gender attitudes and behavior. Teachers and classmates shape ch the children's gender attitudes and in turn, gender differences in cognitive and cognition and behavior. 
Unfortunately, teachers have received relatively little training in recognizing and combating gender stereotypes and prejudices, their own and others, and as a consequence, teachers are often model, expect, reinforce, and lay the foundation for gender differentiation among pupils. Thus, most schools create and maintain rather than counteract traditional gender stereotypes, biases, and differences. However, educators who adopt the commitment to gender egalitarianism and thus promote cross-gender interaction expose pupils to counter-stereotypic mo stereotypic models and discuss and teach challenges to gender stereotyping and harassment optimize their pupils' developmental outcomes. And they go on to say, you know, and encourage parents to not enforce traditional gender models. I don't think people in general are aware that their children are being taught like this. I don't think they know this. And if they did know this, I don't think they would appreciate it. Furthermore, there's also a large portion of parents at this point who have been educated under this paradigm, taught that gender roles are somehow destructive and oppressive, and now they're raising their kids with that predisposition. And then wondering why, especially the boys, they're not performing in these expected gender roles. Because we understand that the general, the general idea is that you can have this new progressive idea that the women are able to embrace, yet at the same time, the expectations of traditional masculinity and things that come from that social contract are expected to be upheld by the boys, when the boys are the least likely, likely to be capable of expressing these things as a result of the environment. And shout out to BGS, who brought the space's attention to the Prussian school system and one of the main models and tenets of the modern industrial age, which essentially trained kids to go work in factories so that they can essentially just follow orders all day. The classrooms were modeled to create environments with regards to that. I think it's very important that people consider the consequence of what that looks like, because what it means is the classrooms have already been tailored to be female. There is already a female predisposition female narratives, female, a female-friendly environment that many studies continue to show aren't necessarily conducive to the way boys learn, especially young boys. They're not, they're not socialized to sit like that. They're not socialized to be able to do these things. And when you get that, the natural result is a population of boys that are just de facto being feminized, but it's being called, quote, gender homogenization and gender egalitarianism. It looks like sterilization to me, but I mean, you know, you hear a lot of these, especially, especially groups that champion intersectional feminism. They really harpoon on this idea of a village model, which I'm going to get into right here because even the way they present this modality, when you make the argument for co-ed schools, which on one side of their neck, they'll acknowledge begrudgingly that it does give better outcomes, but they have obsessed with this idea of toxic masculinity. And again, if we're talking about egalitarianism, there's absolutely no way that there's not a toxic femininity, but I have yet to see any literature talk about anywhere toxic femininity, anywhere. Their obsession in the academy right now is all about toxic masculinity. And I want to get into this article right here. Hopefully it don't bug out on me. Man, that sucks because this article was good. Let me try to reset my browser and see if that helps. Pasting goo. There we go. Let's get down here. Please don't be on some BS. All right. Da, 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 da. Let's see. I'm going down to this section here. So... They make it a point in this article to highlight 
And now this came out uh, in theguardian.com. You guys can take a look at this. Uh, they were examining a lot of research that was coming out of studying uh, co-ed versus single sex schools. And we already know here in America, black boys definitely excel in uh, single sex environments where you know they're surrounded by their peers. And the article kind of covers that, uh, acknowledging the fact that it promotes better behavior. But they're toying around with this different sort of model. Okay, let me get into this. We'll start with where it says for the boys only in this article. And, uh, and the attitude from this crap. The case for girls only. I am not going to be able to read this name. Holy crap. Madhumitha Janga Jarija. Jaraja. Maybe they're from India or maybe they are indigenous Australian. They might be. We'll see. Is grateful for her time in a single sex education. She spent her early years in high school in a single sex school before moving co ed between ages 10 and 12. She says the girls at her school gave her the confidence and freedom to pursue math, science, sports, and pursuits she did not feel she did not feel as supported at her co ed school. One of the advantages of co ed schooling is that even for, from a younger age, I find that girls aren't necessarily given the same opportunities as boys, she claims. When girls are allowed to learn and develop in their own space, they have the opportunity to try out things that aren't thought of as feminine or feminine strengths. Uh, it goes on to state, the academics are definitely right in that separating girls and boys won't produce a different result. And quote, it's much more than that. So here you are, you've got a bunch of folks that are really going out of their way trying to nitpick the results that they see and really get into, and they're going to lead into this toxic masculinity argument pretty soon. Uh, she says the trend of single sex schools like our, our Rami Dale school becoming co-ed is in fact the movement of boys school to co-ed. There aren't girls schools that co-ed. It's basically a boys schools with girls in it and the girls are there to help socialize the boys. So I want you to consider that whole tone of talk with regards to that. So they're starting these girls and they're starting the kids off in, in single gendered schools and then moving them to co-ed schools by the time they get to high school. And the way they're trying to frame it is that the schools ran by boys and the girls are there to quote socialize and create a, a neutral, a neutralization environment to the boys. Anybody that's know that knows anything about sociology understands that Whenever there's a social interaction, the dynamics change the moment you introduce a third person. And the gender of that third person matters because the end result is always going to be very different. If you've got a scenario where there's a woman talking to another woman and then another chick shows up, you get one dynamic. You have a woman and another woman and a dude shows up, you get a different social dynamic. No matter what modalities you change and interchange, you get a different end result. And then that plays out into the macro where that baseline micro expression can expand into a macro expression. And that's how you get group cohesion or lack thereof. That's just how humans socialize. And their model from the onset is simply that when you introduce girls into a social environment, they're the ones that have the social right of way to do the balancing and the coercion. The implications are absolutely ridiculous, but this is the default. And again, this is what these kids, this is what your children are getting learned, are getting exposed to and taught in schools. This is what young potential parents are being taught in university and seen as normal. This is what these psychological organizations are taking as a default and seeing as normal. It goes on. She says the behavior of the street Kevin's boys reflects the problem of toxic masculinity in society rather than being inherent in boys schooling, she says, and it indicates a lack of proper intervention in culture. Quote, I think it's just a reflective a reflection of our society at the moment. And until we get that co-equal world, why would girls want to be in a co-ed environment surrounded by that masculine opinion of them? She says, in quote, quote, Girls will do better on their own until we can work out our societal issues with gender discrimination. (sighs) 
this is where we at fam and this is being taught all over the damn world this is pretty much the the default setting of our gender relationships and it's from the academic sector that this is being supported it's trickling down to the children and i want you guys to remember what what that ultimately creates it is it is an intentional separation and non-socialization that's being encouraged and it's not even done in a way where we can get to what we were talking about earlier which is a culture's role to provide rights of initiation etc cetera, etc cetera. it's just a default assumption that women are the main counterbalancing force and dudes need to get rid of their toxic masculinity so that they can be part of society that's the model that's the socialization model I don't know what on earth anybody here is supposed to do with that. I don't know what I'm what I'm supposed to do with that. I mean, if anybody in the chat got any idea besides ignore it, I mean, <laughs> but let me see here. looking at the next section here because we're going to get into the next point i want to bring up i think that's the section yeah okay i'll get you guys this link next copy and paste and while that's going up we'll go ahead and do another bit of an acknowledgement with uh what's going on in the chat and give me just a moment i'm gonna go grab my phone so i can see what's going on and do some acknowledgements if i need to give me just a second Okay, we've got uh we got a couple contributors on the Cash App we can go ahead and acknowledge and we'll go ahead and do that before we go further and then we'll do some chat acknowledgments afterwards and continue. Let's see, we've got Pernell here earlier that came through. Came through with the contribution. I appreciate you, fam. Wordsmith, I appreciate you. We got Toya the Texan. She says, thank you for extending on my observation. Absolutely. Let's see, we got Sherman. We got a uh, SP. Says for the show of the week. I appreciate that, fam. Charles Gilmore for sharing analysis. I appreciate you. We still going to be cooking, so <laughs> we still got a bit to cover. I appreciate you guys' patience and bearing with me, man. This is a really, it's a lot to kind of digest. And I, I try to base a lot of my statements on uh, this stuff being evidence-based. You know what I'm saying? I don't like saying stuff just to say it. And we got Drew Main says for the research and replay gang i appreciate it man and you guys always are free to leave a comment in the comment section i definitely check the comments uh after these videos go through so i, I want to keep this an open discussion you know all my videos are done in that open discussion format so even though you know i'm not streaming you guys are definitely free to continue talking i certainly appreciate that and you guys can definitely email me any suggestions you have as far as topics is concerned for the future. I'm always down for that. And we got two more that came in just real quick. We got one from Gold P. Says, for rocking with you. Appreciate you, family. And Aqua Techie. Salute to you, fam. Us. All 
All right, let me dig into a few of these comments and acknowledgements real fast and see where we at. Let's see, Black Ooze says, we are ultimately taught to be something. Whether that something is worth the damn is another matter altogether. Facts. <laughs> Facts. Let's see, it's Gilmore says, it is not a choice. Are most black men childless due to personal choice or lack of opportunity? And I say it's a little little mixture of A and B. And it's a trick bag, right? Because if you practice responsible sex and you wrap up, you take various measures of precaution, you still get lumped in with a group of people who aren't. And somehow these babies are happening, you know, immaculately. Apparently Jesus has been busy lately and uh, all these babies are happening somehow for no reason and nobody can be held accountable but these dudes that clearly aren't having children. I don't, I don't, I don't understand this fam. I don't understand. Just, I just smile and nod at this point. Winston says, real talk. A few years ago, I had a male feminist try to tell me with a straight face that misandry doesn't exist. You know what's goofy about that? They will they will hijack civil rights arguments pre-1964 and essentially co-op them by just swapping out race with gender, and they think it plays out the same way. And it's why I vehemently push the idea of social dominance order. So we can put this conversation to rest, at least on a figurative level, because if you're a male in the out group, there's absolutely no way you're experiencing the same thing that women are, because the women are not seen as the same type of biological threat that a man is, because one dude can, can literally populate the entire planet technically, technically. So how much more of a threat are you to a population? If you want any more research on that, all you got to do is peep the ISIS papers from Dr. Francis Cress Welsing. Again, she spells that out with napkin construction paper and real slow with big ass pictures so folks can really get it. But <sighs> folks want to pretend like they can't read. I don't understand. Like Ooh Strike says, the reasons vary, some voluntary and even wise. And even wise, others mostly out of their hands due to females being given almost exclusive domain over where and when and whom kids are born. Shout out to Briffold's Law, case in point, but you let them say it. And apparently there are these droves of black men that, you know, just having all these babies. And uh, even though they represent a minority of black men that are doing this. We're supposed to unite and form Voltron and stop, you know, these these so-called rogue males from doing exactly what we've been seeing happen in these damn mouse utopia experiments, low key. But no, no, let them let them continue to say what they say. Mm. Indeed, part of an agenda by feminist academics. <sighs> I think this is really fast tracking to something else, which is leading me to my inevitable conclusion. Um, it might be an unintended consequence. I like to think that human beings aren't that sinister, but we still have a responsibility to respond to this mess. You know, I think it's fair for us to at least have a heads up and decide on our own how we react to it if we don't have any ability to actually stop this stuff. Because I think that a lot of the legal intervention that could have taken place has been transformed and hidden from plain sight in the virtue of sweeping civil rights conversation. So whenever you talk about an issue that these things are included under, to attack that is to simultaneously attack civil rights as they pertain to race also. Because the apparatus that holds up race is holding this up as well. That's the real sinister trick bag nonsense that I don't agree with that it frustrates me to no end to see the civil rights legislation pretty much hijacked like that. And I believe that a lot of our political turmoil in this country is rooted in that hijacking that took place in 1965, starting with the inclusion of gender, which damn near, damn near endangered the entire bill.
Black Guru says, if you have enough money for private school and still choose to send your black son to a public school, you should be charged with child negligence. I share a similar opinion. And at, at, at best or at worst, you know, if nothing else, you forfeit your right to complain about how that boy turns out. There's too much research that shows the, the, the ridiculous benefits in doing so. But most people see it completely opposite. They've been coached otherwise. And the state gets their money off of that in a completely different way. But, you know, we're going to have somebody that's going to come repelling in from the scene like, where your school at? You build one. Okay. Okay. Let's pretend like we don't understand how society and infrastructure works. Go through a couple more of these. <coughs> Spain man says, I read ISIS papers when I was young and dumb. I need to revisit it now that I am less dumb. Fam, I couldn't agree more. I think it is critical to understanding a lot of this context so folks can stop making it so personal. But I think a lot of what she warned about has already begun happening more so now with how aggressive intersectionalism has gone. And with the introduction of the transforming, well, I'm gonna leave that alone for the next topic we go over in a second. We'll just say the alphabetization has really sped this up and brought a lot of points that she brings up to the surface and made them very relevant. I mean, Black Uru, let them tell it, apparently. You know, they want a hostile takeover of the hood by the educated lame squad. Like, we supposed to come in with the Iron Man armor and be like, hmm, all your base are belong to us now. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I don't I don't see, I don't know how they're going to do it. I don't know how that even makes sense. Opinions on homeschooling. You know, folks were already getting homeschooled during the pandemic anyway. The amount of resources that are available are profound. I think if people want better outcomes, they're going to have to take a more active role in their family's lives, um, specifically with the children. I know even coming up for me, you know, given I was in a public district, they tried it with me and my brother too. They tried it. I had some very key interventions that went down and it, it helped me out in the long run. But this environment is not designed to help people within a certain income class deal with this. And I want to put emphasis on that because people who have means, people who have the resources are going to have a very different context with the way they interface with these changes that are happening in society. Meaning that a lot of the negativity that's being talked about and described now that falls out from this, folks at a certain income level, it's not that they're immune to it. It's just that their ability to respond is far more dynamic than someone who isn't. And they're going to have much more more agency in the way they engage and respond to these things. And I think that makes all the difference. So if you have the resources, take heed to what's being said here. Really consider where your posture is with some of these things. And really compare that to what's happening in the bigger picture. And I think that's just, again, the way my mind works. I, I'm bigger picture oriented. I can appreciate what goes on on the micro level, and I think it's important. I attribute that to discipline, but I think a different language has to be used when you're talking about the macro scenario and you want to affect an average. So let's get into this right here. We've got the next portion where we're getting into the situation with troubled mothers. And just like what we recognized before, there's an obvious pattern. When the mothers are in a position of distress and that socialization process begins to break down and these mothers are coming up in situations of chronic scarcity, you start getting these very antisocial situations. I'm going to link Another article here, well, this is a research. This is a research article from um, 
Library of Medicine again, the National Library of Medicine. So breaking down the maternal filiocide research findings and this particular body of water, oh, body of water, body of research was taking a look at the rates of filiocide, you know, killing women that are killing their kids. And they researched the biggest economic centers in the world when they were looking at this. It states here, the countries represented in the English literature filiocide search were Australia, Austria, Austria, Brazil, Canada, Finland, France, Hong Kong, Japan, Ireland, New England, Sweden, Turkey, the United Kingdom, and the United States. In addition to the studies of mothers who committed filiocide, several studies have investigated the prevalence of filiocide thoughts, filiocidal thoughts in various populations. Then it gets into a lot of the indicators potentially of what may be going down with this and why. Let's start with the first line with infanticide, killing the kids before the age of one, basically. An American macro level study of infanticide, victims of first year of life, found increased rates with economic stress. Although England and Wales have infanticide acts, Scotland doesn't and the countries experience similar rates of infanticide. Maternal infanticide studies in the general population found that predominance of unemployed mothers in their early 20s, many cases occurred in the context of child abuse, though some mothers have associated suicide attempts. Often they experience psychiatric disorders from 36 to 72% of the time. Whereas in Japan, the infant victims frequently displayed physical abnormalities. It goes on to state, you know, describing the macro. The mothers were often poor, socially isolated, full-time caregivers who were victims of domestic violence or had relationship problems, disadvantaged socioeconomic backgrounds, and primarily, and primarily responsible for the children were common. Persisting Persistent crying or child factors were sometimes precipitants for the filiocide. Some mothers had previously abused the child, while others were mentally ill and devoted to their child. Neglectful or abusive mothers were, also, were often substance abusers, and many of the, of the perpetrators had psychosis, depression, or suicidality. I mean... If you look at the way this goes down in a lot of locations, you know, and you see these cases that are showing up in the news, you investigate their backgrounds and it's the same story all over again, over and over and over again. Unstable familial background, unstable environment under which they're growing, they're, uh, they're raising their kids. And all it takes is one event and these kids are just showing up dead. I think they had a recent scenario where, you know, they intercepted this chick who just, you know, kids were just still in the bed, just decomposing. I don't even think she had a reason for it. It was just this gross neglect. She's going to get, a, she got arrested for that, but I mean, we won't follow the story, but this stuff is happening, fam. And it's happening at an accelerated rate. We don't see it going down the same way in second and third world countries like that. But the common denominator is in these, these places where the economy is very advanced, and we've got a lot of the common denominators that remind me of the Mouse Utopia experiments here. Let's see, the next thing I want to get into... is the alphabetization. And now we're starting to slowly shift into the picture I'm painting here for Hive Theory. I want people to remember what we understand about the predisposition of the society already calibrating towards female and the assignment of toxic masculinity, while at the same time, we've got a situation where a percentage of the men are getting un uninhibited access to women in droves. I want that to be understood because what it leaves is a serious disparity between men and women in the social environment. 
specifically as it pertains to the tolerance of the roles. So we already know that the roles are being effectively assigned as being some sort of abusive and archaic modality of existence. But when you couple that with what's happening now with technology, what's happening now on a sociological level, I want to introduce a modality of thought that is catching, I won't say it's catching on. It is, it has become more aware of this phenomenon occurring. And you can get into a very chicken or the egg conversation about this, but I find it interesting. So the first thing I want to present is this article from the BBC that is breaking down gender fluidity and how women are the most likely to engage in that. Let me see, did I break down the other? Uh, I'll get to that in a second. Maybe I'll include it in this one because it's probably, it's probably worth bringing up here. Let me see, did it go through? Yes, it did. Okay. So let me go ahead and start here. Uh, fuck it, we'll start at the top. As we head to 2022, work life is, is running our best, most insightful, most essential stories. Da -da 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 -da. Let me see. The way we think about sexuality is changing. Where there was once a single well-known rainbow pride flag, today a wide array of colorful flags to showcase the diversity of orientations. People simply increasingly open to discussing the sexuality and more unconventional, even formally invisible identities have become part of an increasingly mainstream discourse. With the open dialogue, sexual identities are becoming less rigid and more fluid. Keep what we read in mind. But new data shows that this shift is more prevalent in one group. In many countries, women are embracing sexual fluidity now that much higher rate at much higher rates than they have in the past and more significantly than men overall. So what accounts for this discrepancy? Experts believe that there are many factors that feed into this progression, especially changes in social climate that have let women break out of their conventional gender roles and identities, what we just said. With these new insights, however, the question remains, what does this mean for sexual fluidity in the future for all genders? Goes on to describe. So I'm asking his colleagues, uh, hold on one second. Da -da -da -da. Okay, it says they found that between 2011 and 2019, college age women had increasingly moved away from exclusive heterosexuality. In 2019, 65% of women reported only being attracted to men, a notable decrease from 77% in 2011. I'm going to say that again. 65% reported being only attracted to men. The number of women exclusively having sex with men also dropped between those years. Meanwhile, men's attraction and sexual behavior stayed mostly static in the same time frame. About 85% reported sexual attraction to women only, and close to 90% reported engaging in sex exclusively with women. So I want you to keep this in mind. Because there's this idea that there's just this giant drove of gay dudes running around all over the place, and that's why the black community is in shambles and the world's going to go up under. The overwhelming majority of individuals engaging in this activity are females. And more specifically, women have more fluidity in deciding what they want to have a slice for. It's like a buffet at this point. And I want you to keep in mind with regards to gender fluidity and this freedom that can be expressed and experienced by women, given the backdrop of everything we've talked about. And all it takes is just a little bit of thinking about some current events that have gone down in the last two weeks to really see where this could be going. Let's see. All of this is too complicated to, pin to, one, to pinpoint to one thing. 
says Elizabeth Morgan, associate professor of psychology at Springfield College in Massachusetts. But gender roles and how they both have changed and wait, gender roles and how they both have and have not changed may be a significant factor. So we're, we're back again to the scientists pretty much point all of this to the change in gender roles and how it's shifting and given women freedom to effectively decide what they want to do, whereas the modality with regards to men seems to stay the same and remain hardlocked. Massey and his colleagues largely chalk up the notable change to cultural shifts, like the progress, the progress of feminism and the women's movement, which both changed the socio-political landscape significantly over the past several decades. However, these changes affected men and women differently. Progress has made has really been made around the female gender role and less around the male gender role, says Massey. Although he doesn't discount the LGBTQ plus movement's effect on people identifying as sexually fluid today, Massey believes feminism and the women's movement play a role in why more women identify this way than men, especially as no equivalent men's movement has been able to has enabled men to break out of quote historical gender based restrictions in the same way. We'll go ahead and pause on that article. You can go ahead and take a look at that whenever you get more time. Uh, <laughs> we'll go to some data right now. And this is taken from This is some info from PragerU. And this organization here extrapolates data with regards to that. And I think it's interesting what this has to say here. And you guys can take a look at it for yourselves and see this chart to see the differences in men and women with this gender fluidity that's gone down. It states that most adults identify themselves as heterosexual, meaning they only report being attracted to and engage sex with only members of the opposite sex. However, women ages 18 to 29 are increasingly rejecting exclusive heterosexuality and describing their sexual orientation in other ways. These changes in women's sexuality are not mirrored by their male, by their male peers. That's the primary finding in our recent report on nine years, again, this was a meta study of nine years at the Birmingham Human Sexualities Research Lab, just published in Sexuality and Emerging Adulthood. This study is behind a, pay a paywall, so I had to go through some other sources to, uh, you know, articles that were describing the findings in order to really bring this to you guys. Um, a lot of these, a lot of the research I'm presenting to you is behind paywalls. So that's why it's kind of hard to find something directly from a lot of these sources. But uh, this is what's gone down. But it highlights here. Together with our Birmingham University colleagues, Richard E., Melissa Hardstay, and Ann Merriweather and Maggie M. Parker, we conclude that changes in young adults' sexual orientation are not just a result of increased social acceptance of the alphabet, but are related to feminism and the women's movement. Again, these are common denominators that continue to come up, continually come up, and then the consequence of this modality being presented forward. And without first wave industrialism, I make the argument that you don't get feminism. But there's a, there's a direct relationship between these modalities. These findings align with recent polling by the Gallup organization, which found that American adults are increasingly identifying as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or more than one of those. The Gallup report attributed these changes to increase public awareness and acceptance of people who identify as alphabets, as well as the influence of the 2015 U.S. Supreme Court case which legalized same-sex marriage nationwide. Shout out to Obama. Another potential factor was proposed federal legislation banning the discrimination on the basis of gender identity or sexual orientation. Shout out to Title IX. So they've got several charts here that, <clears throat> that correspond and break a lot of this down. And... Uh, Again, I want people to 
make the make note and observe the pattern that the overwhelming majority of these changes are affecting women's behavior and that men as a default are one getting their definition of their role and gender disproportionately affected relative to the women with regards to their preferences staying the same and wanting women but the society basically saying that you being a man is toxic while simultaneously alienating the men from their role within society just like what we just finished reading about about an hour ago i want people to understand how this has occurred over time gradually I think what I'm going to do, yeah, I'm going to do this one. I wanted to bring this up later, but I think I'm going to bring this down now. I'm going to bring this up now. Give me just a moment. I think I've got two articles that are going to cover this. Yeah, I'll do this prematurely. Let me copy this. See, gender identity and adjustment. Where was this at? Was it the conclusion? Uh, da, 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 da. Individual differences. Approach the analysis. Sorry, a lot of these, a lot of these notes from uh the library of medicine are pretty in depth and they go pretty far down. Uh, intersectional social personal identity results. It's just a child's nature thinking about their gender. Okay. I'm going to hold on to that one and go to this next one here, PubMed. Copy. Let's see. Paste. Okay. Yeah, we got the first one, then I'm going to show the second one. So remember what we just finished seeing with regards to how women are getting, basically hold the sexual fluidity modality and how the role of men is effectively getting restricted every time a lot of this content is brought forward. trying to get you to the charts. I know I got charts for this stuff. That's the research gate. What was research gate? I think this was it. Copy. Let's do one more window. Paste. Okay. All right. It's got to be this right here then. Don't tell me I lost it. Okay. I'll just go ahead and put this down. We'll figure it out later. Uh, Basically, what's happening now, and I'll show you, I'll give you the PDF. It's a little bit hard to read here, but you guys can save this for your records. Here's one of the first studies that were making notice from 1990 to the present that the majority of individuals that are getting a uh, transformer reassignment. I'm going to say genetic, 
not genetic, but uh, gender reassignment, whether it be on the psychological tip or just making that declaration. They've been noticing that the ratio at which you've got men to female versus female to male at a ratio that is completely lopsided. You've got more dudes on a consistent basis that are becoming women than the other way around at a rate of almost two to one. I think it's interesting. And I don't think people take into consideration the weight behind that. I found the spot here. Okay, let's see. I'm going to link this second article which leads to, it leads to a point I made a while ago while I was on some other panels where I talked about how you've got a lot of black boys that are growing up right now. And thanks to the fact that these dudes are growing up with no purpose, they're, they're not being shown or mentored what to do. They're essentially being told that they're toxic, et cetera, et cetera. And their only mirror of masculinity that they have is through the father who, if they're not there, they're receiving a lot of negative reinforcement from the mothers. They're growing up resenting the fact that they're men. And the reality is for a lot of these kids, the only opportunity they get to try to be human is when they're behaving like women. When they behave like women, there's a societal reinforcement to reward that. And Again, I don't think it's a coincidence that when we begin to see this happen and as technology makes itself more able and renders, renders itself more able to make this occur, there are much more men becoming female than females that are becoming male. And it's not to mitigate individuals that may have actual sexual dysmorphia. I think that there is another impetus and direction of compulsion that's going on right here because this is happening at younger and younger ages much younger ages and it's happening all over the world if you've got a predisposition to where these dudes don't see a point in being a man and they're going through this gender reassignment for all intents purposes you have sterilized that dude they're sterilized if they go through with it, that's it for kids if they don't have any already. And I want that in the back of people's minds as we continue going forward into some of the inevitable conclusions. But there's a ton of data that's really breaking this down. And there's some backlash that's being silenced by the major news outlets of all of these dudes that have, that have gotten it. And then, you know, they end up regretting it. And they try to speak out against it because, you know, here they are. They're getting exposed to this by guidance counselors and they ain't but 10 years old. The, the parents are rabid. Fit. Well, I ain't going, I'm not going to use ad hominems, but they've, they've accepted the purple Kool-Aid of this ideology. And they think that they're making the world a better place by adhering to that. And so here they are setting their kids up. And now they're getting into their 20s. They realize they want to have a family in camp. I mean, what in the world do you tell them? How in the world do you deal with that? They just literally sterilize these folks, low key. And it really upsets me at the dishonesty behind it all. Because again, it's masquerading under the cloak of equality and they've hijacked the rhetoric that we used during the civil rights era to gain access to something we should have had during Reconstruction. When you get time, please look up Title IX. This is where your tax dollars are going. This is where the direction of society is headed. I mean, again, obviously, I don't think this is on accident, but when people ask what's going on with the boys, What's going on with the men? How come the men aren't leading? I think it's intellectually dishonest to discount this or downplay it. 
I think people need to sit down and really take an honest look. The rhetoric that are coming out of these policies are having adverse effects that the culture has failed to appropriately engage with. It's been a policy of benign neglect. And given what we talked about earlier with this gender fluidity and sexual fluidity, combine that with the sexual liberation movement, women have such a profound freedom of movement with these dynamics, it's almost comical. And I'm not even going to get into the impairment of pair bond. Actually, actually, I am. Let me see. Did I get into the pair bonding? Thought I had that in my notes. Because that should have been in there with uh, forming healthy relationships. I don't have that in my notes. And maybe I'll make that a separate topic of discussion. But I'm going to add this along with it about how ever since women have started getting cesarean sections, I think that the number has gone from like 30% to something close to 75% across the developed world that the pair bonding chemicals that you're supposed to be getting exposed to, you're not. And it's affecting children in a macro scale and their ability to properly pair bond with the mother, which is a mutually reciprocal experience. The mother with the child and the child with the mother. And I want you to remember what we're learning about emphasize. We just finished talking about those statistics and we're seeing how it's increasing. I think one of the contributors to that factor is boiling down to all of these things that modern technology has been offering. But the consequence of this has been a lot of these side effects that are opening the door and creating predispositions for these things to go under the radar. I think if you look at these in instances of infocide and you compare them to whether or not that child was birthed naturally or through cesarean um, through cesarean section, I think you may find a correlation. But at this point, so many women are getting them done. You know, it, it, it may be too late to actually make that that research. Maybe it's too difficult to draw that correlation. But I see one. See, next point, and we are coming to a close shortly with this point, and then we will get into the next phase here. Uh, <coughs> in the interest of time, because I don't want to keep you guys here for too, too long, I will speed up a little bit. Like I said, I got a lot to say with this topic. Um, the seventh point I wanted to make here was the withdrawal from society on both members, both men and women, effectively opting out of critical aspects of infrastructure that keep the society going. I think that lay down moment that's been spoken about in the chat is very indicative. I want you guys to peep this chart on page one here. And it talks about the rate at which folks are just totally opting out of the workforce. They show a comparison from 2000 to uh, 2013 in this one. And I use this one in particular. Again, this study came out in 2013, this particular chart, 2013. And it's already falling through the floor. It's already dropping significantly, you know, outside of any Pareto correction, like, it's, it was dropping long before COVID. And by the time you get to the COVID era, get this copy and paste it here. Time Magazine covered it recently. It's absolutely nuts. Let me get to the part I wanted to read here. Now, this one is covering post-COVID here. Let me make sure I posted that. Time Magazine, paste, quitting.
Okay, the term for this is being called the great resignation. Let me go here. All right. It says green is one of millions of Americans leaving traditional jobs this year and not choosing to recommit to clocking in at all. This is the highest mass resignation in the U.S. has seen since 2019 pre-COVID uh, pandemic. And the numbers are still rising. In June, 3.9 million quit. In July, it was another 3.9 million. In August, 4.3 million. The numbers are even more notable for young workers. In September, nearly a quarter of workers ages 20 to 34 were not considered part of the U.S. workforce. Some 14 million Americans, according to the Bureau of Labor of Statistics, who were either neither working or looking for a job. For some, it's burnout. For others, the timing was ripe for a refocus on side projects as the stresses of the pandemic started to wane. And for many, especially in the service sector dominated by millennials, those who were in their late 20s on the border of Gen Z and millennial, poor treatment and low wages became unsustainable. Green, rep uh, Green represents one slice of that, who is a 31-year-old with a master's degree. Listen to this. 31-year-old with a master's degree who decided to step back from earning income to make a self-imposed sab sabbatical and live off savings before working for herself one day. Meanwhile, there are an estimated 10.4 million jobs in the U.S. that remain unfilled, as this exodus, exodus is dubbed the Great Recession. It offers young workers time to nurse wounds of the pandemic burnout and untenuable working conditions with dramatic life effects. But this gets interesting when you get into the consequences of that. <clears throat> Let me see, where did this go? Okay, we're gonna scroll down a little bit. It says to pivot and remote work, the pivot to remote work has made it possible for the level of work and life balance for those in their 20s and early 30s. The first generation where half of kids had two parents full-time working at home, he never imagined. That's especially true for millennials of a 2020 Gallup poll, which showed 74% did not want to return to full-time offices in the highest age of any age cohort. Millennial women are also particularly likely to stay home given their need for childcare flexibility. And over 3,000, 309,000 women dropped out of the workforce in September alone. Again, we've got mass numbers of folks just opting out of the workforce and critical infrastructure, which is going to create a situation where there are going to be solutions offered by technology to start filling that role in. Uh, let me see here. And then we'll get to this last point here, which is the rise of failure to launch syndrome. And this one is done by Scientific American. Let's see. Is it going to paywall me or did I disconnect? Let's see. Ah, the link is messing up. Press a one in the chat if you guys can still hear me. I just want to make sure the stream is still good. Okay, so the link is broken. But this is basically showing the stats to uh, the increase in failure to launch syndrome. And basically, it's 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 been rising, you know, in conjunction with all of these other things. And getting back to points we were drawn and making conclusion to earlier, I think that's one of the main things I wanted to put forward uh, with regards to that. And with that, I think I'm gonna set my precedence here for evidence of indicators of 
stagnation that match are very closely related to, ah, that's where the pair bonding modality was at. Uh, issues that we saw in the mouse utopia experiment during phase C where it was in that equilibrium phase. I don't think we're at that death spiral at all. I think we are definitely approaching equilibrium, however. I, I think we're moving out of that population boom stage and depending on where you are in the world and depending on the kind of social space that folks have with regards to the way social media has begun to expand the social space and crowd things over, I think it's had a lot of unintentional consequences as well as other things such as technology overriding our ability to pair bond. For example, the link that's uh, brought here, this again is taken from the library of medicine. This is speaking about the neurobot, the neurology pair bond information and bond disruptive uh, destruction. Basically to, to put it in a nutshell, you know, let me see if I can scroll down to the conclusion for you guys. Uh, let me see. Da -da -da. Okay. Uh, the, the connection between dopamine and events in your life that trigger that and how dopamine plays a critical role in pair bonding. And we already know that a lot of these children are getting exposed to technologies and social media at younger and younger ages. So their neurological pathways and their dopamine reward and uh, motivation drives are being connected to things that don't look human these days. It says here, the evidence reviewed here highlights the utility of the Prairie Vol model to study the neurobiology mechanisms underlying pair bonding formation, bond disruption, disruption, and social buffering. Data has shown that the neurochemicals, uh, dopamine and uh, oxycontin work to create, work in concert to regulate pair bonding formation where epigenetic events are also involved. Such epigenetics includes events which increase the OTR expression, facilitating partner preference information, as well as factors such as social isolation, bond separation, and AMPH exposure that lead to pair bond disruption and also cause dysregulation of dopamine and oxycotton systems. Interestingly, an increased activity in the brain oxycotton system is involved in the regulation of social buffering or pair bonding on stress responses. Basically, if you don't have intact homes, if you don't have intact families, if you don't have intact modalities of balance that are there, you run into a situation where you run the risk of destroying the reward response system. And it keeps you from being able to even cultivate an environment of being able to form relationships. It impairs you, in other words. And I think that's important because it's setting the stage for what we see going forward. I'm going to pause here and get into, I'm going to do a few more acknowledgements and we'll fast forward this section and get into, uh, yeah, OT, OT is Oxycontin. They abbreviate it with OT. We're going to get into some of the very specific technologies that are going to make my theory of the hive dynamic very possible, given what we see happening currently. Oxytocin, sorry, my fault. Oxycontin was something totally different. Oxytocin, right. Right, oxytocin. Appreciate that, fam. Yeah, that's a hormone. It has a direct correlation with uh, dopamine. But uh, let's see. I don't think we got anybody new that came through. We did get Sir Anthony. Oops. Got Ray Hanma came through. Oops. Appreciate you. We've got couple cash apps here too well, we got one black Uru. appreciate you family oh divine dre says yo i heard my co-worker today saying another girl won't stop texting her but she on me shits the, yeah they'll be all right 
It'd be all right. Black Guru Strike says, because sex is much more emotional for females than it is for a male. And there is so much more validation of whatever or of whatever is female. Women are going to be more open to bumping or, as we said, licking and laughing. Yep. Let's see. The alphabet and pronoun community are the only ones that have, quote, gender. Men are male. Males are men. But progressives, in quote, don't know what a woman is. Shout out to that judge. Got him. That came through. Ism. Oh, let's see. LB Crypto. He says, new sub, check you out on BGS. Hopefully we can one-on-one -on -one with Bernard Riley. I mean, anytime, fam. Got D313 says, in other words, the next generation were destroyed. Yeah, these boys are getting set up for failure. Um, it's pretty much criminal at this point. But again, this is just the direction of technology is being pushed into uh the culture co-signs on it now but people want traditional men somehow in this a traditional environment and i don't know how they're going to conjure it up got past the 40 dollars was good irv Oops. i think i got everyone Got brotherly love. Yeah, he was here earlier. Let's see, PK Angel. Oh, glad you can make it. Jordan Zavi asks, Nameless, have you read The Future is Faster Than You Think? No, but it sounds interesting. I'll go ahead and put that down on a to read list so I can get some more peripheral content for this. Tyrone Church, glad you could come through. Oh, Black U says they cannot, and the younger men and they cannot, and the younger men and even trying to do that, yeah, yeah, they, they are even trying to do that nonsense. They really are. Again, I think becoming, you know, going alphabet gives you a way to be human and participate in the political system a lot easier. And I want people to consider this: if you're black and a dude and you alphabetize that puts you in a position to become a triple minority where you're black then you've classified as female and then on top of that you've classified as a female that also is alphabet so there's three different modalities within the civil rights clause that you now gain access to and i think we see a lot of this play out why i think it's going to be an inevitable usurpation just by virtue of the way it's set up because in order to remove it, you'd have to alter civil rights. And that's not happening now. Not, not the way that's going down. So they've kind of set themselves up for failure in a certain degree. So I hope they can reap what they sow and be ready to deal with interesting scenarios that I don't think they signed up for. <laughs> but they finna have it. Uh, you got folks. <laughs> you got folks talking about, you know, alphabets can have periods, too. Like, this is where we're going with that. So they can have fun with every piece of that. <laughs> see we got josh morongo he says the feminine is chaos first timothy first timothy 2 14 and adam was not deceived but the woman being deceived was in the transgression i always say women are empathy or are entropy but it's supposed to be balanced by the addition of energy we need that equilibrium to balance out a system Well, Black Uru, funny you should say that. He says it's going to all collapse unto itself. It states that according to Dr. T and Gigi, intersectionality was designed to disempower Black men, and I can't at all disagree with that. 
One listen to the Combi River Collective, and it tells you all you need to know about what was going on and why. Because it was started by three females who were being alphabetized, and uh, they had a particular idea. Okay, PK said, yeah, I'll put my email in the chat. My email is also on my uh, channel profile if you want to take a look at that, but I'll put it in the chat real quick. And we'll continue with the next phase here, and I'll try to tie this up. Let's see. Uh, again, I thank you guys for your patience for all of this, man. I know this is pretty long and drawn out, but I really want to get these ideas out there because I think there's a lot of points to uh, really consider and ask yourself where you stand in a lot of these ideas and to find ways to begin to formulate a, a language to articulate your concern. Because unfortunately, it's too difficult to talk about most of this without it being perceived as just hating somebody, which isn't the case. It's just that the conversation has been largely had without you understanding what it actually means. And I think it's important because disproportionately, Generation Z is going to be hit with it and I think the overwhelming majority of the Edo social complex doesn't understand how this is directly impacting the outcomes they're, they're complaining about. And I don't think you get changed without understanding the actual condition of the field. I don't see how you alpha your way through policy like this. I don't see it. But uh, we're going to get into tying the, not, tying the, the, the data together here. So what I attempted to show was, number one, demonstrating the research from Dr. John Calhoun and showing how there's an obvious pattern of rise, adjustment, population explosion, population, uh, equal equilibrium, and then eventual decline if no stimulation occurs. And how the key factors in a lot of this are tied directly to the success on having certain baseline physiological needs met in the absence of purpose. And I demonstrated how a lot of these things are playing out globally all over the first developed world, which again, the target of this experiment was to emulate the exact same thing we're looking at. So what I wanna do is in light of these things, I don't think the elites are stupid. I don't think they don't see this happening as they've had time ever since 1960 when this first was introduced to begin projecting and looking out at what they could do to make this happen. And I think a lot of policy was put in place to try to formulate some sort of response to this. And I think at first, you know, with anything, the more time you have to respond to something, the more options that are available to you. But as time goes on and you begin to see the direction that the population is going, because I don't think there's no on switch where you can flip on and just make things happen. I think human beings are dynamic in that they will decide in aggregate a direction to go. I'm drawing the conclusion that we're going to be headed towards a dynamic related towards hives or colonies, almost in a specific sense. And I think that the one factor that's being waited on to, to address these inev the inevitability of this kind of impending collapse and slowing down of progress amongst human beings and society as a whole is to implement this hive modality. And the impetus for it looks to be technology, specifically the fourth industrial wave. And the thing about this fourth industrial wave in technology is it's going to largely hinge and depend on the way the culture decides to engage in on it. So I wanna start with just giving people a quick reminder of what transhumanism is, because I think that's the direct aspect of the fourth industrial wave that's going to bring this about. Not to be accused, uh, confused with transgenderism, it's introducing the idea of a potential singularity with merging the human race, all biological life 
with technological advancement, including, but not limited to, the four primary branches of transhumanism, which are as follows. Data and information systems, nanotechnology, genetic engineering, and artificial intelligence. The big push to bring about this change is largely due to the process of globalization. And there are many models of globalization that people think or have been anticipating will occur. But from the way things look, I believe we're going to be experiencing a kind of regional, ah, oh, it seems I'm having internet issues. Hit a one in the chat if you guys can hear me here, because I think I'm timing out for some reason. Okay, I think I might be back. That particular one went through. Yeah, I think I'm back now. Sorry about that. My internet's being disrespectful now because, you know, I'm talking about this crap. But, uh, yeah, that link in the chat is uh, for some information, a good book that breaks down the fourth industrial revolution, if you guys are curious. But uh, the way the world order is shifting, we're going from a country-based modality of power that seeks to establish balance of power politics between countries and shifting to a more regional model of balance between regions. And this is important because it's creating kind of a demographic crisis amongst different countries to look for talent that can compete in this new environment. And that's critical because what it means is immigration becomes a new forward policy. So when we look at this idea of trying to import talent and find homegrown talent, it changes the way countries and regions have to look at the way they relate to each other with power, especially through trade. So the world is slowly starting to become more interdependent. I can say from the way things look now, <clears throat> at least in North America, there's definitely going to be an attempt to create a region unique to North America and South America combined with a lot of its territories and all over uh, in, in places scattered all over the world and Japan in particular especially due to a lot of the economic conditions that are going on currently in Japan. I think they don't have much of a choice but to side generally with America. It shares an ocean, and even though the distance is there, logistically speaking, the United States and Japan would complement each other, especially with its international interests to get away into Russia and China. So I think this is shaping the global politics, which is opening the door to push these technologies by virtue of transhumanism in the spirit of maintaining competition. So that's why if you guys are following, if you're following politics with regards to the way in, uh, immigration is being handled, traditionally you saw the left side being much more of an advocate for immigration. But people may have noticed that the Republican Party has been starting to greenlight immigration more and more. And this has started causing political splits and people being very disgruntled with that within the Republican Party. And they're losing a lot of votes now to the Libertarian Party as a result of this. So at the end of the day, the general consensus across the board is there needs to be more immigration to prepare for this industrial revolution and we need more, more individuals present here so that we can find people who can participate in these new technologies that are being brought forward that will help the United States region or the North American region stay competitive within this global environment. Because as wars become more and more distant and standing armies become less of a thing and drone and proxy fighting become more important, negotiation and the ability to influence become much more important. I can say that right now, Whoever wins the AI race wins the globalization race because the amount of logistical power that AI can bring about is so much so that you will outscale and outbuild anybody that you're in competition with. Let me 
present a few things here for you guys' record, and we will move on to Hive Theory. Let's start with, uh, I probably should have showed you guys this one earlier, but this is pretty much showing the psychological effects that social media is already having on the younger generation right here. You know, it's already creating situations where essentially because of the sheer amount of information that's being passed on through social media, instead of the traditional, the traditional generational gaps that we're having here, people need to consider that within a year, people are getting ex exposed to more stimulus than people did a hundred years ago over the course of most lifetimes. As a result, the amount of difference that can occur within the span of just 20 years is making it to where the generations are going from, from 20 to 10 years. Now, maybe this isn't being acknowledged on an official capacity, but the amount of sheer difference between kids and five-year blocks is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And I want people to remember the way that can influence the way a society is socialized and the way that it interacts with its social groups. It means that as generations continue to speed up, there's greater levels of alienation based on age. This is largely, again, part of the uh, mass information sector of transhumanism that's only going to escalate as time goes on. So we'll get, we're going to get technologies like implants. We've got uh, the chip that, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, yeah, Neuralink. That came from uh, Elon Musk. There's a lot of different remote technologies that are coming out of that. And the big question people are going to have to ask is, are they ready to give their children these kinds of technologies to give them a one up? And that's important because at the end of the day, since we know that this environment is about to become a hyper competitive, regional, globalized economy, if you don't get some of these technologies, you may get left behind. And if you're left behind, you're going to place yourself in a situation you don't want to be in, where you may find yourself unable to compete. And that's not even getting into the constitutional conversation of, should these individuals with all of these technological and genealogical advancements and advantages, should they get the same rights as you politically? I mean, this is going to make some very major shifts and the way people live very quickly. And I don't think people are prepared to use the old responses to this, which again, has rested largely by social media. Ah, this is the one. Uh... I keep hitting paste, I meant to hit copy. This is the one I was talking about with the differences already between the different generations and how they engage in commerce. Um, where are we at with this? I wanted to get to the CRISPR. I had it up a second ago. Give me just a second. I should have it right here. Uh, paste. Uh, da, da, da. Okay, I'll have to get the CRISPR in a second. I wanted to get the CRISPR before I got to artificial wounds. Where is that link? Technologies, graph things. Oh, it's up here. It's up here. Gotcha, 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 gotcha. Paste and go. Here we are. Copy. So the next point I want to make is the advent of genetic engineering, which is again, one of those pillars of transhumanism. And genetic engineering is important to talk about because what it allows for, and for any of you who have gotten the vaccine, uh, particularly the Pfizer and Moderna, come on now.
Let me know if you guys can hear me because my connection is timing out, it seems like. Okay, looks like it may be connected again. Yeah, it times me out, so it's not letting me see what you guys are saying at times. So if I stop talking, that's why. I'm going to repaste the article I have put in and see if it works this time. Okay, worked that time. All right, so that link is to uh, CRISPR gene editing. Um, if you guys aren't familiar with that, long story short, this tool exists. It has for a while. It helped put your vaccines together. It created the molecule, the RNA strand that uh, it created a whole new method that allows for that to work. But they've been doing other things with it, such as editing gene, uh, editing human embryos. And what people may not have known is the creation of the Lala and Lulu twins who got a genome augmentation using the CRISPR system, the Cas9 system in particular, to leave them in a position to where they're able to resist the AIDS virus. So there are already people who have been born with genetic modifications. And there is a lot of literature that's talking about it. But the big problem they're having with this stuff is that the lawmakers are so far behind talking about it, it's almost comical. There's this scientist that created those Lala and Lulu twins that they that dude just now got out of jail and they're coming to a decision on what to do about it. But the point remains that it's only a matter of time before a lot of this becomes commercial, which means you can begin to augment embryos. Yeah, the Lala and Lulu twins. I gave you a, a link to it. You can read about that in the link I presented there. I think they're three years old right now. And this other link here, I won't do too much reading on them now because I'll let you guys take a look at it in your free time when you get time in the interest of time. Um, it's talking about how these folks, oh, did I disconnect again? No, it looks like I'm good. Sounds like I'm good. Yeah, this article right here is talking about an individual that is already getting a lot of these implants. Right now, a majority of these implants are geared towards trying to help people who have adverse physical conditions. But there's already talk about trying to find ways to use this in a sense to augment people who don't have any issues and seeing the effects of utilizing a lot of these technologies in children that are younger so that they can augment their abilities even further and have greater neuroelasticity with it so that they can perform better with it all. You know, again, it creates a intrinsic advantage, which again, people are going to have to consider where they stand with these technologies because you're going to be, your children are going to be competing against other children who have these things. And if you, you're going to be surprised at how many folks are co-signing out the gate with it and then others who are vehemently opposed to it. If you don't consider the implications of a lot of these things now, you're going to be in for a rude awakening. But I said all of that to say this. This is the big one here. And what a lot of us that have this conversation think is the big holdup. And that is the artificial womb. And what I, I don't think people understand how far along this system is. Let me go ahead and I'm going to read this part because I think it's important. Let me get to this section here. Uh, da, 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 da. I think I can get to the conclusion. Oh, 
Where is it at? I think I need to go to the conclusion. Da, 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 da. So the system they use, they're calling it the Eve Biobag Artificial Womb Technology. And when it was really first introduced, they they obviously did this with other entities besides human beings. But they're at a point, and when, at the time that this came out, again, this is getting the library of medicine uh, produced this. By the time this came out, they're already in a position to start considering working on humans for this, and they already are. And I'll give you another article to that, but I want to read this conclusion for you guys real quick. Two research teams have, have claimed proof of principle for artificial womb technology. It is plausible that soon there could be calls to test their devices, which might drastically improve the prospect for preterms on humans. It is necessary, therefore, to consider how and when we should use experimental artificial womb technology on humans. Little attention has been paid to the ethical issues of artificial womb research. It is often assumed that artificial womb technology constitutes an innovative, beneficial treatment and thus would emerge almost by accident. The tendency to conceptualize experimental uses of artificial womb technology as innovative treatment as extensions of current NIC and therefore justifiable in the best interests of preterms is flawed. So, you know, at the end of the day, there are two things that are holding this back just slightly a time barrier and the ethics behind it. So all that has to happen is for some sort of pressing issue to, to be brought forward, for somebody to break the ethics barrier and say, F it, we're gonna do it live. And there are a lot of populations in the world right now. I'm looking at Japan in particular who may find themselves in a position to where this looks like a, an attractive option in lieu of so many others that have not gone right. I want to offer you one of the more recent articles on this that have come down. And it's just a paragraph long here. Uh, scientists in the Netherlands say that they are within 10 years of developing an artificial womb that could save the lives of premature babies. Premature birth before 37 weeks is globally the biggest cause of death among newborns, but the development also raises ethical questions about the future of baby making. This, this isn't a, if it's going to happen, it's already going down. When you look at what this is going to have as far as a disruptive factor to the culture, women by and large haven't experienced the same level of role interruption by virtue of technology that men have. But when we look at what's coming down the line in this, in, in this fourth industrial wave, I think people are not ready for what's going down. And when you look at the social environment currently, and we look at what could happen if left to its own devices, everything I've laid forward with what could be produced from the fruits of the fourth industrial wave, just from transhumanism alone, seem to be setting society up for a very particular trajectory that I am calling hive theory. So what I wanna do is show you the makeup of a typical hive. And a hive, generally speaking, has three social classes. Let's see if this will all fit. Yes, it will. Yes, it will. Let's see. Da, 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 da. Yeah, this is worth reading. Okay. So it says beehive hierarchy and activities. Each of our hives has about, da, 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 I'll go to here. It talks about the three main casts within a hive. The first is the queen bee. The queen is like the goddess. Her life is committed to selfless service by being the reproductive center of the hive. She lays eggs, about 1,500 per day, and only leaves the hive once in her life in order to mate. Becoming the queen bee is a matter of luck. Queens become queens only because eggs they lay had good fortune of being laid in cells specifically designated for raising queens. Then they are fed more royal jelly, which <coughs> contains more honey and pollen than larval jelly. Uh, 
I don't think that's important. The point is, there's only one. When the queen dies, or if she slows down egg production, worker bees once again designate queen cells and raise a new virgin queen. Next, we have female workers. I'm going to skip male drones. Well, no, we'll go in order. Fuck it. Male drones. And the key word is drone. A male drone has only one purpose in life, to mate with the queen. And there are 100 female worker bees for every one drone male. Let's say that again. 100 worker bees for every one drone male. Oh, don't tell me I disconnected. Okay, I think the, the link I sent didn't go through. So I'll send it again. Okay. Did you guys hear me uh, talk about the queen? If not, just a quick recap. There's only one. And uh, her creation is pretty damn random. And she's the sole female that does all the reproducing. So we've got one class that does all of the reproduction. That's pretty much it. Next, we've got the drone class. Again, a male drone only has one purpose in life, which is to mate with the queen. And there are 100 female worker bees for every male drone. While this may be appealing to some males, a drone's life is hardly enviable. Drones are incapable of feeding themselves, foraging food. They lack stingers. It's a key thing. They lack stingers. And they may die, and they die immediately after mating. <laughs> And when times are lean during the winter, when the queen does not mate, worker bees force drones outside the hive, leaving them to starve. So the point is the male class becomes a disposable class that only has one purpose, which is to procreate. But they're doing all the procreation. They're very isolated from the rest of the tribe, rest of the hive. And again, they serve one general purpose. And then we get to the female worker bees, which if you've done the math, it means that the overwhelming majority in a hive that are doing all of the work, that are making everything pretty much function, are females. But there's a nuance to them. A woman's work never ends, end quote. Nowhere is this statement truer than in the hive, where all the work is done by female bees, which outnumber male bees by a ratio of 100 to 1. Worker bees are responsible for every job in the hive except, except reproduction. The female worker bees have different positions within the hive. Some are scouts, some are guards, some care for the queen, some produce honey, etc. Below are some of the jobs in the hive. And they get into some of the different specialized, nuanced roles that the female worker bees can perform that are in service to the hive. Now I'm gonna pause here. Remember what I said about artificial wombs, genetic modifications, and having neurological implants and nanotechnology that could be implemented in people's systems? If you've got reproduction that effectively is being handed over to by and being monitored by agencies other than the family, we'll say, are largely influenced and encouraged for people to hyper-specialize and have genetic modifications that further assist them in doing so, the social dynamic of reproduction between man and woman naturally looks like it could change, and this model seems to naturally fit that definition. In such a scenario, if we consider what the problems were with regards to the Mouse Utopia experiment, where the critical point of failure was, which was failure to reproduce and lack of maternal instinct, and the societal predisposition for the role of male to slowly begin to disappear into ambiguity and furthermore shift into identifying from gender fluidity into being female, specifically a non-reproducing female. I'm seeing a clear line of trajectory, family. It's why I call it hive theory. There's a lot of different research you can pull up on hive structure, but when I see what's going on, what could happen, when I see the direction that society is going with the technology, when I see a lot of the laws that are being put in place, when I see the political and economic pressure of globalism, it all looks like it, it's setting the stage for this kind of modality. And what I don't see is people sitting down and really asking themselves hard questions 
on where they stand on a lot of these issues. Meanwhile, many of these things are being pushed forward through the court system, state, local, and federal, effectively unopposed. And the people who are opposing it are folks that are extremely on the left or right. I think this is this is definitely worth having a conversation over. I think it's worth considering. This really forms kind of my world outlook view on what I see happening to society. Again, this is my subjective opinion. I do my best to provide an evidence-based opinion on what I see. And I don't want to keep this to myself per se, but I think this is worth examining from a thread-by-thread -thread basis because I think it may help inform you to make a more informed decision on what you see when we're having these conversations, not just in the space, but in your everyday life and how it shapes your politics and your worldview. I think there's a little bit more at stake than just someone's opinion on a political topic. I think there's a lot more going on with education and the issues that intersectional feminism has presented and planted into the society. I think it's having consequences that are likely very unintended, but are having long lasting and in some instances, irreversible effects that I don't know how you address that. There's no putting the toothpaste back into the toothpaste uh, tube. I don't see it. I think we're in a position now where it's so far off that we can make a response, but it's too close to avoid this. I think to some degree on each of these modalities, we're going to have to come up with the answer to it, whether it is an answer in aggregate in the macro as a community or in your micro life as it pertains to your immediate family and the way they perceive these policies. I encourage you guys to go back, listen to this episode, take a look at a lot of the information presented here. Don't look at these things in isolation. Because if you zoom in close enough on a picture, everything looks like a bunch of dots anyway. You don't see this until you zoom out and begin to really look into context as to what has already occurred, what's happening now, and it will give you a clear indication of what's on the way. If you can maintain that kind of posture, I think, again, your ability to respond to this will greatly improve, or at least you'll be much more informed. I think this is a good place for me to pause for now. I could elaborate further on this and get on into the, the different individual aspects of it. But uh, person one in the chat, if you guys are interested in listening to a panel, I can definitely drop the link and we can have a little bit of dialogue over what was talked about and uh, you know bounce off some ideas or do some clarification or go into a little bit of detail on some specifics. But uh, you know, if you if you guys have any questions or if you want to come up and chop it up, you're definitely welcome to. I'll go ahead and put the link in the chat for you guys. See, and I need to upgrade this stream yard. <laughs> I think after tonight I'll be able to, so I'll go ahead and get that knocked out. Also, uh, Cash App came in from uh, your initials are SH. I appreciate that family. So links in the chat if you guys are ready or if you have any questions, we'll chop it up. If not, we can definitely start winding down. But irrespective, I definitely appreciate your time and your patience with this. You can expect me to maybe go into a little bit more detail in the future with some of the things we chopped it up with. But that, in a nutshell, is hive theory, or my hive theory.
Of course, fam. And if anything comes up, feel free to use the comments section. I want to keep the comments open for, you know, continued discussion on this. Because I know a lot of people are probably going to end up being offended by some of the things I brought up and maybe take some of the things said in isolation and out of context. So I definitely want to control and address that. But again, I think this presents some ideas that I don't think people have given enough time to consider. And I really believe they should. I think it would be in their best interest to. Uh, because I don't think they have considered all of these policies and some of the unintended consequences behind it all. Appreciate that. Oh, fam, you'd be surprised, man. Folks would be insulted at, you know, bringing up the periodic table. Let's see, Mr. S. Uh, let me see. Who are you in chat? Uh, so I know, say something in the main chat. So I know who you are, Mr. S. In fact, what I can do, I think, is... Can I... Solo layout, let's see. Okay, Scott, got you. Go ahead and add you. Thank you. What's going on, fam? What's going on? What's good? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, man. Go ahead and shoot, man. Whatever questions you have or points you want to bring up, go ahead. I'm all ears. Oh, I didn't have no particular questions. I thought you was just going to extend... Cause, cause, cause the hype theory. Uh, I am, I am on the base level. Very um, familiar with uh, transhumanism, so that's why I decided to come listen to you tonight. <clears throat> okay, so you you've got some familiarity with uh, transhumanism in the way that. Breaks yes, down. the the basis of it, the basis of it. Right. When you describe the four components, yes. Right. Right. And. It's interesting when you get into that point because I don't think people appreciate how far along this is and how really the only governing factor really is the ethics behind it. Right. If you don't know a little bit about on that, go ahead and speak on that. Um, Cause I don't think, I don't think people really get how we're at a conjunction where most of this technology is doing what magic is doing in fiction. Yeah, I, I always like to call, um, I, I just call technology sometimes, I like to call it sometimes the reverse engineering of magic. It's, it's crazy that you use that word. Mm. Um, it's almost like the people who, um, who push for transhumanism, they, they're trying to find their own way to do magic. It's like they don't believe in the times of the old where we was able to do this uh, naturally, quote unquote. And um, as far as the ethics of it, that, that, that's, that's, that's when people will start to, like you said, start to notice it. And, and by that time, it will be too late. I think we're there now. And uh, people's ability, and this is where I get concerned at, because I think this hive theory is going to disproportionately affect individuals that are at the bottom currently. If you're in that lower bracket of income, I think folks are about to be hard locked into their spot in society. And that's where we're going to run into a lot of these problems at this point, because with the quality of life improvements that are on the way, I think the bottom mm -hmm. rung of society is going to be living like upper middle class does now. And so all of this is going to be completely invisible. But at the same time, Ooh. folks that are at the upper echelon, they're going to be living like literal gods. I mean, think about all the life extension technology that's going to be coming out as a result of that. Then think about the technically new class of human that's going to be rolling out as a result of that. Mm. 
and how these same people are going to be entitled to the Constitution like everybody else. I don't know how you maintain a balanced society that doesn't delve into what we saw during the civil rights era. Mm -hmm. And I think ironically enough, you can make an argument for the last 30 to 40 years as far as America's um, hegemony and um, rulership over the earth has actually been a pretty much even an even playing field for most, most of the races in the countries on this earth. So this will actually bring us back to disproportionate um, levels. Ironically enough, but. Well, America <laughs> is, is going to have to deal with its power bubble that it's created for itself. It's no longer going to be the sole superpower. And so it's going to have to negotiate and it's going to have to compete, really. Because at the end Correct. of the day, America's never had to compete with anybody. The Monroe Doctrine pretty much guaranteed that. But if AI can pretty much make your advantage null and void, the only thing you can do is compete at that point. And America has had a policy of removing competition. That's how it deals with that issue. It just doesn't have a culture of competition, especially when you look at other parts in the world like China, where that's all they freaking do is compete with each other. The culture, it's like it's almost written in binary code to just compete on everything. And so the things that come out, a lot of the potentiality for that country to create game changers, the, the raw talent pool that it's cultivated as a result of having that as its base culture, it's, mm -hmm. it's been calibrating itself to deal with this regional globalization model for a very, very long time. And it's why, again, America is going to be forced to run into this full speed, full speed. And I don't see issues of race the way we understand them now being given the time of day that they are, because it's kind of what's holding it back. I don't see in the future there being a white or black, just this person of color, racial ambiguity under this umbrella that's roughly described as American. And I don't uh -huh. think people are ready for that, like the, the transition of how that occurs. I think the ADO social complex is already primed for this to happen. They don't realize it yet, but they're already primed for it. But I think mm. the ones that are going to have the greatest resistance towards it is going to be the white demographic. Absolutely. Because the previous definition politically of a citizen in America was predicated on that. And if we understand that the orientation of black is oftentimes determined by there being a pre-existing definition of white, if both modalities have to disappear because of the recessive nature and phenotype that that classification of white is based off of, as people mix, that's the first thing to disappear. So the only way you offset that is to maintain an exclusivity with that group, but that group is slowly shrinking. And lo and behold, a lot of that population does overcrowd and overrepresent the bottom economic echelon of the society as well. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to have That's direct true. access to these technologies the same way others are. So let me ask you this then. Um, will it be a situation where now, if we're talking about um, quote unquote artificial human beings, will that create two classes where it will be, well, for the, the previous problems was black versus white, but now will we ironically enough join together to say, well, at least we're human beings compared to what, what, is, what is this new thing that we're coming, uh, that's, coming upon? That's my point. I think right. the conversation is going to be based on civil rights, and it's going to be based on the Title IX aspect of civil rights that has employed this idea of gender. And I want you to peep the language being used in these conversations. And then remember what we talked about today, and imagine instead of somebody that's becoming alphabetized, someone that's following the path of synchronicity and employing genetic engineering, employing uh, nanotechnology to replace internal systems within their body, getting certain implants that give them advantages, uh, augmenting themselves with artificial intelligence. Mm. Let me, I have another question as well. Absolutely. Will, will, will that also mean that, um, <clears throat> oh man, it slipped my mind. Please excuse me. It slipped my mind. Are you fine? Take your time, fam. But, uh, oh, no, yeah. 
does it does it also mean that they probably low key have been preparing for this because this is why we have to kind of get used to transgenderism, genderless things. They kind of been kind of setting the table because they probably know this is what's coming down the line. Because before you even talk about uh, artificial human beings, you got to even be used to um, somebody who's kind of androgynous. Yep. So, so that's why I dropped uh, all those links. When folks go back on the replay, now that you see how this ends, the way I've concluded it, I think the beginning will make more sense. Why I spent so much time on what I did, uh, going back and looking at what the concerns of the government have been throughout the 1900s as a result of this information and policy changes that have been lined up as a result of that. And why, if when you look at the official position of folks behind the party here, why it seems to favor this alphabetization, why there seems to be a controlled demolition of support for strictly black and white and more of an influence and push for person of color and the, alphabet, the alphabetization uh. of this modality it is conditioning the population for this thing because what's going to happen with generation alpha and beta that's coming up? What is their temperament and predisposition, especially the ones being raised by the Z's who are already leaving the workforce and are being accustomed to a situation where automation has started to take over the working sector? Right. You get people that are slowly becoming calibrated to perform hyper-specialized jobs and roles in the future that are largely more intellectual property-based. And I didn't even get into really emphasizing what the information systems part was, but I think a better, a better correlation of what that looks like is going to be VR in the metaverse. I think people are going to have a dual presence in society. You're going to have right. your physical presence. And then you're going to have your avatar that represents you in the metaverse space and this idea of augmented reality. And I think mm -hmm. that people, people are failing to understand how these things will create a different way that people interface with each other and connect. And a lot of these issues are going to start, the issues we have now are going to be seen as archaic, I believe. And I think they're oh, yeah. just looking for the right time to, again, do the controlled demolition of removing the pins so that it can quietly disappear into the background, starting to have certain language and context be classified as hate speech and all this other stuff to where, you know, they can get to the bottom line. Because at the end of the day, the United States is not interested in being left behind. And it's not going to stop a place like China from moving forward with a lot of these modalities or, you know, Russia, et cetera. This is a race to see what region is going to define the new global order of things. And for mm -hmm. America, it's all hands on deck and they don't have time for the race conversation anymore. I, I have a question. It might be slight off topic. Do you see um, America turning into an, uh, a complete Totaler, totalitarianism, uh, I'm probably saying that word wrong, but like a dictatorship. Yeah, totalitarian right, um, right wing totalitarianism no. in, in, the, in the near future. No, I think, again, really? it's going to implement either way. The Art of War says utilize the orthodox, or rather, the orthodox becomes the unorthodox, and the unorthodox becomes the orthodox. This is precisely the idea of left and right wing politics. Okay. I think what we're going to see is the society is going to get calibrated to take advantage of a liberal approach towards all of this. But to make that happen, there's going to have to be a de-escalation of the polarization between these two parties over time. So the extremes on both, I think, are going to get tempered. And as a result, we're going to see a flip floppiness of each of these things. One regime may implement a whole bunch I of agree. aggressive changes. And then all of a I sudden, agree. we're going to have a bunch of changes that are going to repeal some of that back. And what's going to happen is a kind of calibration looks like it's going to occur. And I want people to pay attention to the overall message of what's being said. Don't buy into the hyperbolic statements that are being made. Look at what's actually being voted on. Look at how it's actually being implemented. And look at the overall numbers of what's happening. And think you'll find a pattern. The key thing is they need to tailor the population to get ready for this. And they need to make sure there's enough funding 
to research the technologies that are going to posture them to take advantage of this. So if you look at that massive omnibus legislation that got pushed by Biden recently, a lot mm -hmm. of that money is going to sectors in the economy that are exactly tailored to answering and addressing and developing these things we're talking about. You're talking about like biotechnologies, Correct. genetic editing. That, info, okay. that, that big infrastructure bill. Go look at it. It's on Wikipedia. Oh, you can see all of that. Okay. You see what mm. I'm saying? So money is already being set aside for it. Right now, it's a race. It's a race between the resources, time, money, the availability for it, and conditioning the population to be acceptable for it and removing the major barriers that are hindering it. And for the United States in particular, because it's not a totalitarian, it's a liberal government, it has to get rid of the two extreme modalities that pretty much the country set itself on. It should have nipped this in the bud during Reconstruction, but it failed to do mm -hmm. so. And so now it's forced to try to deal with it now. And again, the alternatives are a lot of the news, a lot of the, the political ideas that you see being presented now. But because people aren't aware of the bigger picture and all they're doing is responding to their immediate micro scenario, all they can do is respond with what they're aware of, which is very low level things that, are, aren't, that aren't affecting the macro. And they're misposturing their politics and not understanding what it is they're, they're I'm going to say, getting, presenting. Mm -hmm. Let me reword this. If they care about a nuclear family model, they need to be more vocal about the policies that are acting against it because the nuclear family model is being moved out of the way for a totally different one. And I don't think most people understand what goes away when you do that. And they need to ask themselves some critical situations. If they understood mm. what that bigger picture looked like, they may rethink their orientation and perspective of the nuclear family model. But I want you to pay attention to a lot of the language, specifically what's coming out of intersectional feminism and the way it's being postured and why this idea of toxic femininity is being presented forward. It ultimately, in my subjective opinion, presents the possibility of the neurological and sociological profile of the non-reproducing female in the form of the male that's not reproducing. Yet has this hyper-specialized role that it performs in society just like the worker bee. Followed by a lot of arguments presented from the 80-20 principle via Briffold's law and hypergamy where only a certain percentage of dudes are doing all the procreating. Like, this is, this is what you get. So once more, you know, there's a lot more bigger picture macro going on here that effectively is just really being swept under the rug unfortunately and if they can take the time to put those pieces together and ask themselves hard questions do i care about this modality do i care about the roles of family the roles of men and women not just in a micro instance with your immediate family but in the 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 sub the sub macro instance of the community you know, where do you believe people stand? What do you think should happen? Because in order to get that, you need the cooperation of it all. Because again, the environment is being tailored to be hostile towards these concepts, specifically hostile towards the males. And if people want something different, they're going to have to make an acknowledgement of it and really take some steps to autocorrect. Because intersectional feminism has really done a lot to conflate female liberation or black people liberation and villainize the idea of masculinity forming traditional roles whose only goal is to provide the levels of protection and stability that everyone's asking for and making them synonymous with depression. It's driving a lot of boys to the point where they don't even want a Y chromosome anymore and they're doing what they can to become female just to be human at least from their perspective. And we're going to see a whole lot more of that. And if you have this going down and you've got a guidance counselor that's that's already set with the clipboard going, oh, you've got gender dysmorphia. I mean, that's what's happening in these schools right now to a lot of these kids. A lot of parents got no idea. They don't know that's what they're co-signing. Furthermore, you've got a lot of celebrities that are co-signing on that. 
and are influencing people across the board. You got to ask your question. Is this what you really want? Because this is the direction we're headed. So with that said, you know, this is in a nutshell, hive theory. It, it again is my subjective opinion. I'm not purporting to be some sort of scientist, but I presented as many primary source pieces of evidence to support my idea. And uh, I think if it's possible, you guys should consider it. Feel free to share this with folks you know. Uh, go back and research some of the resources I offered you guys and uh, definitely contribute in the comments section. Got Mr. S came back up again. He may have disconnected. What's going yes. on, fam? Yes, hello. Um, Yeah, I had disconnected. My phone had died. I nah, apologize. You're good family. You're yes. Family. Yeah, Um, I have a question. Um, Where does this leave uh MGTOW, the black manosphere because i know it seems to me like bgs said the other day we're gonna get more into the politics side of things and that's the reason why i'd asked you about if we're gonna turn into a totalitarianism because it seems to me that um people of my age i'm i'm, I'm a millennial right okay. like you said we're, we're we're becoming more um nuclear family oriented are we just going to go out um, are we going to go down without a fight? I mean, I don't like to even say go down. I, I, I like to think things happen. If things happen, it was a death. It was death. It was destined to happen. But like, where where is our play in the next several years on on all of this? Did you hear my conversation I had with uh, Dr. T. Hassan Johnson when I introduced the idea of political Mandalorianism? No, I didn't hear it, and I listen to him often. Um, I, I didn't hear that conversation. I, I might have to check it out. When he went over his 14-point plan, a lot of the points on that plan stand in opposition to all the things that I'm talking about. And correct, their goal is to create a retarding effect on these things so that these things can be reduced a bit. Mm. Give, me, give me just a moment. I'm going to add Sal Sean here. Make sure that's him. What's going on, fam? Is that you? Yes, sir. What's going on with your family? How you doing? Everything's good, man. Everything's great. I think this is the first time I had you up. Uh, no, you did <laughs> this months ago. Okay, it was it's, a it's, while it's, 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 it's been a while. It's been a while. Okay, welcome back, then, fam. Yeah, definitely, man. You always, you always bring the fire. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. my thing is, um, obviously, I need to do more research, but from what it sounds, I definitely need to listen to the playback. But to me. It sounds like there's going to be a serious divide between the top 20% and everybody else. Really right. 10, but I would say 20%. And obviously from a, from a base level, you know, uh, you really don't see changes in history unless people can't eat for the most part. And right. obviously, I guess in these quote-unquote modern times, um, if they don't have you know, money. So that's why I also see all these, well, the social programs that they're changing now with, you know, all this giving out funny money. I think this has been, and I was saying this back in 2020, I said, if I were in the government, this would be a perfect time to really test out, you know, all these, um, just, just giving out money right. or funny money. And that's exactly what happened. But I also told everybody, I'm like, yo, that, that's going to lead to crazy inflation. And a lot of people are going to fall behind. And, and this is going to be the time for you to really get ahead, you know, if you put your head down and, and you know, just move right. forward. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's almost 2023. And here we are. But now, obviously, listening to you for like a damn near year, I'm like, OK, I definitely see that. I need to do more homework on, you know, the science side of things, the sociology side of things. But I just, you know, and I'm just straight raw with stuff. I just think the vast majority of people, it's over for them. That's, the, that's just how I see it. Because change is, change is very hard. And I, I, just mean, don't, I just don't see most people catching up. I, that's, that's the name of the game, right? And most people have invited this modality to express itself. This is something that the people are asking for in general. But I don't think they have been educated on what those implications of are when they get what they ask for. <clears throat> like they rubbed the genie, they got their wish, but 
yeah, here's all these unintended consequences you weren't prepared for. So, so they basically committed suicide and they don't know it. I won't say suicide. We don't necessarily know exactly how this is going to play out. Okay. But I think this is an evasion strategy that can provide, it can scratch a few check marks. If they know that there's a potential, potential collapse and they've got the signs that are showing already and they already have the population pre-calibrated for a lot of these things. The race is now how fast can we get societal approval of these technologies and how fast can we get these rolled out so that we can have a baseline set that isn't cost absorbent. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. So yes. It, it leads, there's a measure of freedom right now and you kind of touched on it. People who are already culturally calibrated to not work this way are going to operate in a traditional sense. And in a way, they will continue to function as they had in antiquity. But I think they're going to make up a majority of the upper class. I think we're going to see some of the sharpest stratification in history. But the issue mm. is the bottom is going to have so much higher of a, and better of a way of life that if compared to the way people live now, it's going to seem like, again, they're living like upper middle class. Uh, if right, you compare correct. that lower class to the actual <clears throat> upper class, they're going to be living like gods. I mean, think about the life extension technologies available. Yeah. The thing that they're going to have access to with, and, and people are downplaying this, what it's, what's going to happen with this augmented technology, this augmented reality. Do you understand how much they were able to do with this NFT bullshit? And then imagine if you can sell fake assets online and if you're the individual that controls the metaverse, you can create infinite space, basically. So now you've created virtual real estate that scales tulips. to infinity. But, but it's still there's still, still tulips. It's got to transfer into something that's practical that people can really use. It's tangible, can, yeah. Right. If, if right. it's not tangible, mm -hmm. they can't use it even in the virtual space, okay? If they can't get something tangible out of it, then it's going to flop just like tulips did. Right. So they can introduce something like you can do work in the metaverse and then take that and flip it to actually buy currency in real life that gets you food or something it, but, like but that. It's got, but even, even if you do work in the metaverse, it's got to transfer it into something that's tangible. But right. but but when you when you say that it would be two folds, one would be for production, and the other one would be for entertainment. Because in video games, we were already doing that anyway. We couldn't use those tokens outside of the game, right? With mm -hmm. the microtransactions. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah but, but at some at some point, okay, even if it's tokens, okay, microtransactions, even if it's tokens, okay. What do you trade for? You trade for one entertainment spot to another. You trade it for true, true. online sex. You got to trade it for something. It's got to be true. something yep. that's going to relate into, in, into something that's tangible. And what I've, what I've seen interesting lately is that um, in some of these MMOs, you can use Bitcoin to start buying certain things in game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can. Yeah, for you sure. can use Bitcoin to go to uh, certain realtors and outlets that will let you use that currency to get certain things. And if you mm -hmm. do certain things in the game, for example, you can even convert some of that to Bitcoin as well, depending on what you're playing. Which is, which I think sets the tone for it. It got so crazy that you had folks uh, in China that were making businesses whose job was to farm as much currency that they could in game and they were flipping it to real life profit yeah it's, <laughs> guy, yeah, the... it's, it's just entertainment it's, it's yeah. the same thing as if you if you if you uh if you have a rap song or you have a r&b song or you have a, a, a video or a movie or yeah. even porn it's the same thing it's entertainment okay. yeah but, but bgs welcome welcome thanks for coming up yeah. fam. i want to make sure yeah. i give you your intro i oh, no appreciate the support <laughs> but yeah, uh but, but it, yeah, the, ahead, the thing ahead. is is that the thing is is that you got to remember, none of this stuff has ever been tried before. That's what you got to realize. This right. They have no idea whether this stuff is going to work because it's never been tried before. Yeah. Um, you could either get success or total collapse. And, and and flipping it and living at a higher level doesn't mean anything if you don't have a support. You got to remember, uh, the, the, the top of the pyramid doesn't exist by itself. Right. It needs that base of support. It otherwise needs the base, it's a okay. Point. Yeah, you can live as long as you want. But the thing is, are you going to be out there uh, scrounging for food? Okay, or mm. <laughs> you can't eat Bitcoin, fam. You can't eat Bitcoin. Mm. <laughs> or are you in the in the kind of energy that uh, a self sustaining robot's going to need that hasn't come online yet. Okay, if you find it, right. if you find that that infinite energy, well, then yeah, you probably could. Then you don't need uh, need anywhere near as many people. But the thing is, until then, that's the breakthrough that has to happen. You know. Battery technology, uh, energy technology. That's the crisis we're having right now. Um, you're saying that the 
at this point, uh, you have reached the maximum amount of people that this this kind of uh, energy civilization can handle. That's what's right. happening right now. And we're hitting diminishing so, so, so returns when, already. When, when, yeah, you say fighting it over already, but saying you got nine billion people, that's like I'm saying that's that's the extent of it. Because after that, then um, you're going to quickly chew up all your remaining energy. It's not that you don't have enough. The thing is, you got more people using it. Right. Yeah. So if you don't have any kind of alternative to actually run these machines, machines don't run on nothing. Got to remember right. they don't they don't just you can have invent as many machines to take um, to do the work as you want. The thing is, they run on energy. Where does it come from? Right. Now, now speaking of the energy, right? I understand, mm -hmm. you know, these, these ESGs, which we already see is a massive failure, especially, you know, in Europe. So I don't even know why America's going that route. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm understanding is this might piss people off, but I don't see anything more efficient, at least at this point, than nuclear. I just don't. Yeah, well, right it, now. It, what I'm saying is nuclear, nuclear, one the problem with nuclear, and everybody knows it, okay, nuclear, uh, a nuclear plant over time is going to degrade, okay, yeah. and it's going to mm. become dangerous. That's like, um, it can only run for, you know, what, a nuclear plant can only run for like 40, 50 years before we have to years. replace it. Yeah. That's why they got it, the first ones that decommissioned. The decommissioned because, right. because it starts to degrade, and then after it starts to degrade, that, that fuel is going to start to leak out into the environment, so... But there's a lot of different there's a lot of different sources that are being looked into for example with mm -hmm. uh, uh battery efficiencies that's a mm -hmm. big one that's being uh looked into uh electromagnetic propulsion is probably the biggest industry that's being investigated right now and that's pretty much where a, a good portion of research is being aimed at because yeah. to a low yeah. scale, it's already been done. They just need to shrink it, make it more efficient, and boost the amperage. We have to have to. What well, the thing is, boost the amperage. The thing is, at the end of the day, where does the where does the energy uh, for electromagnetic propulsion come from? Well, supposedly, free. on well, see, and that's where you get some of the. It's not free. It's just <laughs> at a greatly reduced consumption rate. So. Mm -hmm. I think that's the transition stage. I think we're going to run into a hybridization stage pretty soon where, you know, depending on I'm jumping around because this kind of deserves its own topic. Right. Because there's yeah, a profit yeah. margin conversation to be had about this as well. That's also yeah. retarding efforts. Like, yes, I think a place like China gets a little bit more freedom to do it, but they get hard capped off of resources. And then a place like the United States, there's so many extra interests involved that they don't want to let this get developed too quickly and then they can't profit off of the remaining reserves they have. Correct, correct. But then now you've got a global crisis now where now mm -hmm. there's energy going on because of the goofiness going on in the Ukraine and potential things that may mm -hmm. break out elsewhere. And yeah. now their other profit margins are being uh, reduced because Africa's not donating things for free anymore. So, I mean, it's, it's interesting to see how they you, want to address that you you're busting up the efficiency of the system and that's what you're really seeing right now okay you had an efficient system that's like them things were cheap right yeah. that people were willing to work for a certain amount of money or whatever it is okay because the efficiency of the system with what happens when you start fighting over the system and it's not as efficient as you as it once was you get what, we, what you got and the thing is how long can this last you know right. at, at what point at what point do um do uh uh, the adults come back in the room and said, "You know what? This is not worth it." But but that day is not the day. Definitely not. So strap up for more price increases and mm, yeah. Yeah. a lot oh, yeah. of this... penny pension in the near future. If it wasn't for <laughs> you, you probably see it. Or if it wasn't for an election year, you probably see it already. Right. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, nameless, I, I had a question. Oh no, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, as far as an authoritarian government. You, you, you know, okay. Um, and uh, Snake Man said this, uh, I think, on one of my last streams. Okay. Okay. You have to have a culture that will allow an authoritarian government. You just can't impose an authoritarian government in a liberal uh, system. Doesn't work that way. Because uh, if that was the case, uh, the, the best taste, t a test case for authoritarian government to see if it would work or not in the United States was COVID. Okay. Yes. All they asked you to do was put on a mask. What happened? It worked for the most part. No, it didn't. Most people didn't. Most people hated it. Most people actually uh, went against it. 
Yeah, yeah compare majority. the compliance. Yeah, compare the compliance level between here China. and Japan, and China. for example, oh, and yeah. China. Yeah. Like yeah. it's not. Oh, okay, that's right. Nine day. Right. Nine so day. that's why I made the mention of it being, you know, a left versus right kind of calibration modality where you're stepping mm. on a scale. You know, on yeah. one end, they'll they'll introduce authoritarian light, and then they'll introduce liberal light, and then you know. <laughs> Depending on what stays or goes, that's how they calibrate and they just run with it. So yeah, well, that's kind of how this. Well, liberalism always the thing. The difference between that is, say, um, that's why communism could never exist in in, in a liberal country, right? Because uh, communism is the big levant, you know, the Viathan, the big state, okay, right. that controls everything. Could never happen here. In fact, that was the biggest. You know, that was the the, the, the if you if you if, if you look at. Uh, um, if you look at the beginning of this country, that was the biggest fight. What's, what kind of uh, government should we have, right? Should we have the, the big federalism, the big federal state that was controlled from the center or, or the independent states that control themselves, right? That fight still goes on. Yeah. I mean, that is the crux of our politics, which is why I, I said it's a calibration modality. Yeah. Yeah. It's just it swings back and forth depending on what regime's in charge of the White House you, or that's, state that's governments, etc. That's why it's slow. Any rollout is slow in a liberal country because you have to persuade the vast majority of the population to go along with it. Yep. It takes time. Whereas in an authoritarian country, you know, short period of time, just do it. Yep. So how will we be able to compete with China? Because you they won't. can, they can move. Oh, thank That's you. the catch. Thank you. We're you so thank far you. behind. Yes, <laughs> we can't no, you won't. Stop it on shit. You won't. You won't. You. you got, you got too many things working against you. Uh, thank you. To compete with China, um, and quit. Let's say, go back and read Tragedy and Hope. First six chapters, he lays it all out. Okay, yeah. the the perfect case for not including China because the, the buffer fringe uh, doesn't have the dinosaurs or the restrictions of old technology to compete against it. So, the, so like. In other words, you don't have old trees. Okay, if you, if you look at a forest, right? What prevents new trees from growing? Old trees are taking up all the sunlight. What happens if you clear off all the old trees? The new trees grow. So new yeah. technologies and stuff like that will grow faster. And China, China's taking, um, you know, from the old uh, old Cold War, they're taking the best technology from both from Russia and from the East, which is the Asia and and uh, and, and the Russians and the West. And combining mm -hmm. the two, okay. That's why the, um, yeah, I think I just read an article, you know, and you probably read this too, uh, nameless. Um, a, about a week ago, they said the uh, United States air superiority uh, over um, Asia is impossible because of the J20s. They're pumping them out so fast that it's impossible. Yeah. yeah. It's I impossible. mean, but Ch but China is an aging population, though. So I guess okay, this is okay, just okay. An well, aging population means something if you want to if you if you want to. Uh, if you want to consider the uh, the social contract, right? Our social contracts, it means we take care of our aged people, right? Okay, we don't let them die because that's the contract that the uh, that the liberal countries have made with its population. If you work, you get old. We're gonna we're gonna see that you have a decent life in your old age. Right. right? Okay. So China is not like that. Authoritarian okay. countries. Okay. If they die, they die. Yeah. Right. Because they can again. They we got to remember. When we when we talk about the percentage of a population on a hard numerical scale of who's involved in making moves and pushing this, mm -hmm. it's so abysmal compared to the general population. There's no contest. Like even if China gets a huge reduction in a lot of these things, they've got enough money. They've got enough sub organizations. Like mm -hmm. you got to remember, China has enough diversity economically com e from economic. From an economic com competitive standpoint, mm -hmm. you can take each of the different provinces and they can operate as though they're their own country technically. Yeah, and yeah. what they do is yeah. they direct all of that competition inwardly to where even if all of them lost 10%, there's so many of them engaged in that there's some yeah. spark of potential breakthrough that can happen, which is why it's my subjective <laughs> opinion. Regions like that are going to have the biggest talent pools. India is a similar mm -hmm. story. It's just that they are running into more of a resource issue than China is yeah. because China at least got to augment and siphon a lot from yeah. Africa and it's, it's opening its trade initiatives throughout all of the and, old world at this and, point. And, yep. and plus India, India would, even though it has a big population, it's not, as a, it's not an authoritarian <clears throat> government. Okay? They don't have the control of their people like China does. Yeah. No, the British kind of disrupted a lot of that. Yeah, well, they, they, well, India is actually a piece together country. By, by by the British, same way Nigeria was pieced together right. country. But China's mm. been a whole for five thousand years. 
Yeah, yeah. good luck breaking that up. And they're, and they're more than three times the size of us in it, terms of population. So it, it five, yeah, yeah. Crazy. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. Well, five times the size almost. Yeah. So it, yeah, but that 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 you know that's that's the issue they're having. The only the only we can I'll talk about it for you know a couple of minutes. But the thing is, the only the issue that they're having is that um, China China really is ahead of schedule as far as what they're doing right now. Okay, they're about. 15 years ahead of 15 maybe 20 years ahead of schedule because wow. the stuff they're doing now they weren't supposed to be doing it till 2035 or 2040 so when, when but bgs they, yes sir does, does uh if they were ahead of schedule why do they want taiwan the second biggest chip uh thing they still need okay. that piece well, let's, let's, let's put it this way okay okay would you would you allow china set up a a, a, a military beachhead in puerto rico no Hell no. Or or or, or <laughs> the border of Mex or the border of Mexico. No. No. Why not? Too close to us. Too close to us. Too close to home. Oh, really? So <laughs> so so you expect you expect do you, uh, Chinese to, to give up with control of Taiwan? It's right off their was it hundred miles off their coast? Really? Mm -hmm. that so so what I want you to what I want you to do, fam, mm -hmm. is start taking a look at what Japan is doing. Because at this point, America does have a lot of different assets and artificial islands that uh, they can take advantage of, like what China's doing. But that is the pretext behind a lot of the conflict that's happening out there, which is why the Monroe for Doctrine sure. is mentioned for there. So all that's going to leave are places like the Philippines and Japan to have the United States have some sort of launch point off of the form of a level of resistance. And you're going to start seeing the militarization of these areas a lot more being brought up in the next five to 10 years, which I think is going to open the door for a lot of trade between the United States and Japan as far as the unique issues that they yeah. have that they're trying to solve. So pay attention to the currency out there at the end. But, but, but the thing is, that's yeah, the thing. Yeah. But, but the thing is, you look, everybody's looking at the military side, right? But the military side is not where the real war is. Real war is the currency. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Right. It's That's Fauci why I said knows. look at the yen. If, 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 no, don't look at the yen. Look at look at the new BRICS uh, 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 currencies yes. and infrastructure that's going on right now because mm -hmm. that's the parallel system. The yen is actually part of the SWIFT system, which mm -hmm. is part of the American system. Yep. Okay. Right. That's right. right. The, right. What 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 what, what uh, the BRICS are building is the, Fauci always knows it because he follows this crap, right? Yeah. They're, they're building a parallel <laughs> system, and if you know if you really know how the dollar system works, and I'm not going to do it here because I know I'll get my ass in trouble, right? Um, go 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 go! Check out Michael Hudson, okay, and, and listen to down. what he says about he he, he actually wrote the plan of, about the post uh, Bretton Woods so called post Bretton Woods system in 1971 for for the Nixon administration, okay. He actually wrote the wrote the plan for him and actually published a book called Super Imperialism. So he knows he knows this particular post uh, Bretton Woods system inside and out. Gotcha. Because mm -hmm. because he, he actually wrote the plan. So listen to what he says, and that's how I come. I peep game, okay? Okay, it makes sense about what's going on because because he actually uh, told you what was going on. It's a it's a it's a natural reaction that the United States is doing this. It's in, the thing is, how far to the mat will they go? Got gotcha. you. Okay, okay. But that's but that's that's the real war. The real war is the shooting <clears throat> war that you see is not the real war. And Saudi Saudi knows that. You know, so you know, he ain't yeah. gonna say it, but he knows it. It's not the real war. Yeah. Damn, they not playing with this book. What the fuck? Which on which book is that? Right here. Super imperialism. Oh yeah, it's, Michael it's, Hudson. It was yeah, it seventy five dollars. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I looked. You can probably find some it, movie PDF. It, 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 it is on PDF. You can actually find it on PDF. Yeah, because okay. the book is old. The book's almost like book's got to be at least forty years old. They got a third edition that came out, so he's probably updated it. He did update it. Yeah, fact, I think it came out in 2021. Yeah, yep. yeah, I was looking yep. at it. September 30. <laughs> yeah, I was still, like, man, you know. Yeah. They... <laughs> it, it's it's a thick book, but the, the, the original is in a PDF. Okay, <laughs> got you. But then with that, that, you know, but that's that's aside. That's probably way off the topic of where we're at right now. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's good to understand, you know, where this plays into as a role of policy, because again, that's kind of the context that. I was talking about how hive theory or what I'm presenting as hive theory could be a response to mm -hmm. some of the projected issues that again were highlighted in the 60s <laughs> with the John Calhoun experiment, yeah. which could again be kind of terraforming a lot of the policies that are directly affecting the social complex, particularly is, with this whole gender role nonsense. 
which is something they've been, they've been seeing since the um, since the industrial revolution. You gotta remember right. the if you if you look at the fertility chart uh, of the of the uh, 18th century versus the 19th century, right? Um, basically, the the fertility rate went down by two thirds. You know, just I'm in that surprised. in that century. Yeah, yeah, in that century. And remember the chart that chart I, I have you people about Brazil, right? When women went to work and the fertility yep. rate, it just fell to the floor. Fell to the and, floor. And, and I'm, I'm pretty, were you here the whole time? Because I think I did a section where I broke down uh, the global fertility fertility rate. Mm -hmm. And I showed the difference between the population growth versus the t the fertility rate. And I, I think people kind of conflate the two. And yeah, there's a difference. Yes. The difference. Yep. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and what people want to look at is the fertility rate, not so much the growth. The, ro the yeah. growth is kind of assumed. But, yeah. uh, you know, it's it's matching. The global trends are matching the micro trends, and the same common denominators are there. Yeah. You know, it's like yeah, when it's you drop the yeah. F word, <laughs> when you drop the F word in a society, yeah. man. Yeah. 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 Which is, which is, off the sink. When, you, when you change the uh, cultural environment, you, you change the rules. It is what it is. You can no way to escape it. As soon as you change the, uh, basically, the uh, physical environment, you're going to change the cultural environment. As soon as you change that, whatever's going on, uh, in the environment uh, where you borrow this stuff from, it's going to happen. Yep. So it's going they're going to follow each other just like little lemmings off the cliffs. Now, my the problem I've I've been having about this, you know, with the, the gender roles in this country is, okay, if I'm if I'm if I'm playing chess and I'm at the highest level of power, why would I, why would I want to masculinize the females and feminize the males? That. I can't get past that. It doesn't make sense to me. Uh, 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 it's it's basically this is <clears throat> once and this is a, you know I actually pointed it out. This me and Gigi actually pointed this out with the okay. uh, um, with the with actually researching the uh, the um, the custody of infants. Right? Okay. This was already happening. Okay. If you if you look at the Empire Cotton, especially that, that's why I hip you to the Empire Cotton, the seventh chapter, right, uh, right. where he talks about how how uh, they transferred the, the slave model to the factory model, okay? And the available labor, um, the available labor was women and children, okay? Because more Okay, of, yep, yep, okay. yep. So it, it, the women were part of it, it's mostly the children that they wanted because they were cheaper, they are more numerous. Yeah. And the things, they belonged to the father. So the thing is, the thing is, so they had to separate the, the mother and the children away from the, from the, from the patriarch, which is the father. So if you do that, what's going to happen? She's going to she's she's going to have to assume the role of a man because she's got to work independently without the uh, without the edicts of man. So you take her out of her her the role that Natural she's had element. for you know, mm -hmm. five four or five thousand years, right? Or maybe even hundred thousand years. Who knows, right? And mm -hmm. you put her in a different element. Okay, once you set that in motion, okay, that's where feminism and all this stuff actually started. There was no feminism in the um, in the eighteenth century. <clears throat> feminism didn't start to 50, feminism didn't start until the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution, and a social contract. That's what socialism comes from. It's a social contract. Even yeah. even uh, what we call uh, liberalism is a social part of the social contract. It's all the same thing, right? But it, it couldn't take off until you got the environment to where it could actually flourish. And the, exactly. the liberalism couldn't flourish until you got the Industrial Revolution. But you're going to change everything. So basically. That's when you actually, uh, that's when Mearsheimer says you focus on individual rights, right? Individual rights. So every person has the same individual rights as everybody else. So, so basically, they, they make you a unit instead of a male and female. That's why eventually oh. what's going to happen over time, if, you, if everybody's a, a, is, is, a, uh, is a unit or a, a basically an individual person, right? Then there's no separation. So you're going to eliminate everything else, gender roles, uh, everything else, right? And thus the hive modality works almost <laughs> seamlessly. And you've yeah. got the technology that supports it all. It's just a smooth running engine. And you you find a role, you find a place within this globalization hierarchy. Right. It supports almost infinite expansion. And as communication technology improves and you can begin automating a lot of these processes, mm -hmm. you know, you can start spreading out almost on any planetary surface like yeah. when they really get wow. this technology mastered and they can start going like to different moons here like you know maybe some moons on jupiter uh stuff past the asteroid belt maybe even mm -hmm. venus if uh, mm -hmm. they can get these yeah. extreme environments handled you're going to start seeing planetary colonization on a level that looks like some starcraft crap 
Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah it, 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 they found out what human beings you, and, and this is what, uh, that's basically what Damus has been saying. You change the environment, you're going to change the culture. You change the culture, you're going to change the people. And yep. basically, and basically, I did this video maybe, God, what, 2015 on my uh, Black Gnostics, my MGTOW channel, Black Gnostics Speaks, okay? Singularity means what? One thing. When, when you, when you're, when your physical environment, your cultural environment, and your and your biology all meet up and, 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 and basically accelerates at the same speed. And where we 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 got we got the physical environment almost down. Uh, the cultural environment is going to change when, 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 with it. Okay. The, the thing is, the biology of the person is a sticking point because it only can, it can only change so fast. That's, That's where right. we have people going nuts. Yeah. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. When you when you have this rapid technological change they can't handle this like got people all these people laying flat and going nuts they can't handle this it's too fast right Bam. it's even mm. at a point where the microbiome is causing changes yeah where they're finding that you know they can they can accelerate people's ability to cope with these things by addressing the microbiome so yeah. a lot of the testing field is happening in some of these extreme areas on earth yeah. so yeah. people start paying attention to them talking about going to places like antarctica or even under the sea to begin colonizing these areas with these smart cities. I want to start talking about smart cities a bit more as well so they can see, you know, how some of this is being implemented with urban planning. And mm, China has been a big proponent for a lot of these things and pushing oh, yeah. some of that forward as well as some parts in the Middle East. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you could in any major city, the, any major city <laughs> that I call the Emerald City, you can see them. Why well, do you think they're, they're taking out uh, instead of expanding car lanes, they're taking them out? putting yeah. in bike lanes, stuff like that. They're making smart cities. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for they're sure, doing, for sure. yeah, they're, they're doing that right over here where I'm at. Oh, yeah. 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 Right Fuck in front of your face. People say, what's what's next? You're looking right at it, okay? Yeah. The thing is that you take somebody like name is actually say, look, look here. This is this is where this is going, okay? So you're looking at a change right in front of your face, but you don't understand it. Yeah. Mm. Context, fam. When I hear these comments about, who's the past? It's like, fam, come on. <laughs> Oh, come on, like, <laughs> oh well, I try, man. I I really try to present these with, with as good they, faith they, as possible. <laughs> they, they they just like you know what uh, I learned this man back in the mid in the in the in the, uh, in the arts, man. Okay, um, you're eight you eighteen months to three years ahead. They're not gonna see it until three years from now. The thing is, they'll be they'll look back. They said I saw I've seen this someplace before. Instead of it going right by them and not noticing, they'll they'll, they'll peep it. Said I've seen this before. Uh, then they'll go back and look. Said, oh, this is what they were talking about. So this should be happening. And then they'll go back and look at what the rest of it is. But that's that's the way it happens. Even in the manosphere, man, a lot of stuff that I said five years ago is just now starting to happen. I said, what did BGS said back five years ago? Wait a minute. What did, did, what, what, let me go back and look. And that's the whole reason mm. for it. Okay, you that's the whole reason that you you put it like even the 14 point plan for Dr. Johnson, he put that up two right. years ago. Yeah. And, and yeah. He, he thought it was he thought it wasn't gonna go anywhere. I said, man, I said just just write it so it'll be there when it's needed, right? Yep. Two years later, boom. It's right, it, it's needed now. So that's what happens. You're we're what I what I've tried to do, you know, with nameless and 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 uh and and Nicole Ali and and the rest of the you know the what we call the uh <laughs> the eggheads, mm -hmm. yeah, we call it eggheads, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Is is <laughs> not to convince the man, the black manosphere of anything, right? Is to show them stuff, so that when you know, show them stuff ahead of time, so when when it happens or it gets close to happening, they can see it. Oh, I, I, I I've seen this someplace before, right? And I said, oh, I remember. Okay, we've been warned that this was going to happen. So now, now, what is the remedy that they came up with for this? for this instance so that's all nameless is doing he's showing you this stuff before it happens and nameless, nameless is talking about maybe five ten fifteen years away we don't know because the thing is he's showing you now he's showing that it's being built so you can follow it as it's being built so when the, when you get to it you won't be surprised right again it's just like it, there's a difference between the hook you see coming and as a result your ability to roll with the punch and change your inertia Versus mm -hmm. the one you don't see that completely knocks you knocks you to hell yeah. out. The difference yeah, is yeah. fractions of a second. Mm -hmm. That's why mm -hmm. I made the parallel. There's no avoiding it. We're going to get hit. The yeah. difference is you can now determine how you take that hit at this point. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. think yeah. it will make the, a tremendous difference. Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah. Like they said all this stuff that's going on now is, you know, I actually said it, you know, back in 2017. I said China's China's taking control of the uh, of the global infrastructure. People said, no, nah, man, I don't see it. See it now, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Even before then. No, no, not really. G, G, you, uh, I it actually can go back in my archives in 2017, right at the same, right around the same day, because uh, they had uh, they had the World Economic Forum the same day that uh, that, that uh, Trump was being inaugurated. 2017. I actually put a video out there that was Xi is at the World Economic Forum in 2017. He, he, he's never hit, they had uh, a Chinese premier had never been there before, never been there since, but he came that day. Why? Oh, okay. Why? Mm-hmm. No, wait, wait. Never before, never since. Why? To announce okay. Building Road. Mm, yeah. Yep. Be just that's okay. what I was talking about last night. Yep, the Belt and Road Initiative. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Even, mm-hmm. even though yeah, though they announced you know, uh, even though they had talked about Belt and Road back in twenty twelve. So Yeah, yep. Yeah. But that but I, thing is he announced that they're actually gonna go forward with it in twenty seventeen. Mm. But I, but that's that's what it's for. So so basically so so anybody that that does follow the the black manager should should if not uh, you know should 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 not be surprised at the very least not be surprised even like even like when we uh, maybe was when we were actually talking about uh, Roe uh, Roe v Wade yes like a long time ago a while okay. ago well, yeah and we were well, kind of looking at ago. yeah we were looking at some of the uh, the the greater impacts and how you know there's there's well um, that was when we were making a lot of the arguments and really putting forward the 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 comparison between what went down with Roe v. Wade and kind of the projected effects of trying to reduce the black population through eugenics. That's yeah, what started yeah. the, the conversation being brought about, but then folks yeah. didn't think that it would actually get repealed. And we were showing the effects it was having on white folks. Mm-hmm. And everybody was acting brand new about it. And we were like, look, <laughs> they can't afford this right now. <laughs> they can't afford it. They're going through something about it. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, they they have to slow this. They can't stop it, but they're trying to slow it down. Yeah, can't stop it. But that's yeah, that's. But 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 all this is you know what, what the name is talking about is contingent. But you got to get through the moment. You know, and that's yep. what I was trying to say. Yeah. You got to get through the moment. But thing is, is the well, basically, you know, um, if your spiritual believe that we are uh, the children of, of God, the children of, of the Creator, right? Our our, our job is to create. And this is just the next evolution of, of creation, whether you like it or not. So we're gonna, it's gonna happen, uh, whether they slow it down, they stop it this time. But thing is, it's gonna reboot sometime in the future. So this is just what we do, and this we 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 terraform our, our not only our environment but also ourselves. Yeah. And this mm. is just, and this is this is gonna be in motion. They've been playing, man. They've been talking about this for the last 130 years. It's not new. They've been talking about this. You go back to. Uh, uh, Brave New World, Aldous Huxley. Okay, what you've yep. seen is Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. This was in a book in the 1930s. Talk, they talked about enacting those technologies in 2000. You know, 2020. For sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's Almost. it's with that it's with that that my concern ends up being you know some of Dr. John Calhoun's later work that really didn't get a lot of support and funding. Mm -hmm. which was his efforts to try to circumvent that. And I kind of stand behind a lot of what he came to the conclusion to and what Dr. Abraham Maslow came to a conclusion to Mm -hmm. and helping to found the baseline of positive psychology, of addressing finding purpose and really working towards self-actualization. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's underplayed because people – People all throughout history have been talking, talking about that and saying the same thing. But I think now more than ever, these kind of things are going to be important because it's the things that you can't replace with technology that ends up getting lost. That mm. creates the biggest issues down the line when we're interfacing with yeah. these things. And that's yeah. the whole spirit of why I introduced the idea of the nameless path and, you know, addressing the idea of the mind, body and spirit as a unit so that you can, you know, adapt and find purpose and reason in all of these things without necessarily having to rely on religion or, you know, being able to contextualize it for the reality you're facing now. 
And I want to explore that into the future. For example, getting into how augmented reality can be used to go through spiritual training, you know, help mm -hmm. people understand mm. their own psychology a bit deeper. You know, I, I've got a saying that's tied to the nameless path, which is the body is nothing more than a means by which the spirit is cultivated through the mind. So if you can understand that complete total system of involvement in reality, I think you can kind of at least circumvent some of the negative downsides of purpose of purposelessness or what's the word I'm looking for? Lack of hope, uh, despair, you know, that kind of stems from that fear of not knowing what to do. Because at the end of the day, a lot of folks in the space get accused of just being these nihilistic monsters that don't care about nothing and want everybody to be miserable. But I don't, I don't think that's the case at all. I think people have not asked the hard questions and kind of like what Nietzsche was talking about with the death of God and, you know, the birth of Zarathustra or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. this, he was talking about this, like, what do you do when people find out God's dead in quote, like all the mm -hmm. mysticism, all the nonsense is lifted up. How mm -hmm. do human beings respond? And I think people have responded poorly to this reality. Yeah. And they'll, now they'll people just, are, they'll just recreate him. That's all. Oh, yeah. Okay. We see that happening now. God's being recreated and reintroduced, which is why mm -hmm. I'm calling, you know, things like augmented reality, a revision of the spirit world that was being employed back in mm -hmm. older cultures and whatnot. So, mm -hmm. you know, those same rules then apply because the common denominator between all of these is still the human experience. Mm -hmm. So if the culture isn't taking time to adopt to these changes, you're going to start seeing effects in the social environment that, again, may not be in your best interest because these decisions are going to be operating outside of your agency. So if people want to change, they need to challenge themselves and really ask these difficult questions that I don't see them doing. And I think, you know, for the most part, maybe some folks hadn't thought about it too much till now, but I want to start pushing these topics forward, you know, and, and really, really have this sort of shape the narrative in the back of people's minds. Because I think it adds context to things like SYSBM, because we know that traditionally immigration has been a way of addressing the lack of a social role within a particular social order. So mm -hmm. if folks want to push these dudes out and, you know, they're they're invisible and all of that. OK, let them immigrate. Why do you care? I mean, they're going to go out and recreate lives themselves in another environment mm -hmm. and they're they're needed in a lot of these locations. So I don't see a reason not to. Mm, right. Yeah. Well, you, anytime you bring in new people from a new culture, it's just going to be pushed back. And thing is, how do you, how do you actually um, integrate these people? And that's always a problem. That's always been a problem, you know. It is, but I it. think we're in a good position to at least have an alternative, rather than folks just being trapped here with in despair with no idea to do what to do. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, well, I think they should be honest with people that they're doing this intentionally instead of lying. Say no, they're just coming over the border and. And it's just uh, just willy nilly, and that's the whole thing, you know. It, uh, tell them what they're coming over, why they're coming over, what they're coming over for, and how to. And, and it'll and it'll be probably easier to integrate them instead but, of this, instead of it, dumping them and said, "Oh, we don't know how these people got here. They just walked across the border." <laughs> that goofiness. Yeah. My goodness. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, these these forty thousand children just showed up at this camp uh, all by themselves, and they came eighteen hundred miles away. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. But uh, I got a couple. Life. I got a couple cash apps I want to acknowledge right. here. Uh, we got one from uh, JJ Muddix. I appreciate you, family. He says for great brain candy, aka live stream. Salute to you, famos. And we've got another donation from JJ. Uh, salute to you, fam. Didn't have a message. Oh, he said for the for the mic. Guess that's a live stream. Os, appreciate you. But uh, I guess we're at the four hour, four and a half hour mark. I didn't realize yeah. all that time yeah. passed, man. It happened out of yeah. nowhere. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Definitely <laughs> look out for part two on this topic. You guys responded very positive towards it. I, I definitely appreciate it. Uh, the next stream I do, I'm probably going to finish up uh, some of the verbal martial art that I've been working on. We'll be getting on Sword Form 6. That's going to deal with... <laughs> the myth of equality and getting into <laughs> equilibrium and entropy. So all my physics majors are going to love these laws of thermodynamics. We're going to be mm. applying the sociology and the goofiness mm. we see with feminism because I think it really needs to be addressed. Mm. You can't 
you can't introduce entropy to a system without adding more energy unless you want to kill it. So, I mean, mm-hmm. <laughs> here we go. Mm-hmm. It, 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 it's universal. So, entropy yep. is universal. Yep. You no, know, even beyond <laughs> physics. Yep. So, with that said, family, right. uh, it's it's always an honor, a pleasure. Thanks for coming up. Uh, Mr. S, you're welcome anytime. Salchi, I see you all the time. Fam, holla. BGS, you already know what it is. <laughs> I already know what it is. <laughs> I just came up for a little, a little support. That's all. But, Appreciate uh, that, family. All right. but, uh, thank uh, you. Thank stuff, you. Folk, no thank problem. You. For the folks on the channel, uh, for the folks on the chat, for the folks in the space, thank you for your time. Thank you for all that you've done. Definitely join the replay gang. Leave some comments um, whenever you guys see anything that you want to review. My uh, email is always open for topic opportunities, so just send me a mail whenever you're free. Uh, until then, I'll see you on these YouTube streets. This has been the Nameless Protagonist. Oops.